it is my pleasure to introduce Alexandria's mayor, Justin Wilson. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Good morning. Uh, I want to welcome everyone uh, to uh, this Ramsey Homes Symposium that the city of Alexandria is hosting. Here is a jam packed day uh, today, as, uh, as Eric mentioned, full of folks with uh, deep expertise, interesting findings, and plenty of credentials. Uh, but before you get to hear from them, you have to deal you have to deal with me, and I have none of those things. Uh, so I want to um, I want to welcome you, and uh, let me begin uh, by thanking and recognizing all the partnerships uh, that got us here today: um, the Alexander Redevelopment and Housing Authority (VHD LLC), the City's Office of Housing, the Department of Planning and Zoning, the Office of Historic Alexandria, the Virginia State Historic Preservation Office. Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, the many city commissions, stakeholders, individuals who are interested in all the issues related to housing affordability and historic preservation in our city, um, and of course, all of the speakers that you're going to hear from today. You know, almost 80 years ago to the day, uh, the Lanham Act Alexandria Defense Housing Project, VA 44133, received administrative approval to proceed. Later that year, 80 years ago, the federal government purchased four vacant parcels to build housing for African-American defense workers. Eight decades later, we're gathered here virtually, if you will, to uh, kick off a symposium about the history of the site, the construction of Ramsey Homes, its place in history, but far more importantly, we're here to talk about the people. In 2015, our Board of Architectural Review denied the request by the Alexander Redevelopment and Housing Authority for a permit to demolish the Ramsey homes. And they found that architectural and cultural significance of these 1940s buildings. That led to a very challenging and difficult community process to explore alternatives, which culminated in 2018 when Ramsey homes were demolished to make way for a new mixed income community comprised of housing affordable to low income and moderate income households, including residents of the existing public housing as well as 37 new housing units. I've been on council for 10 years and I've heard a lot of ridiculous names for new developments. And I'll be honest, I might have initially rolled my eyes when I heard that the new Ramsey homes would be called the lineage on North Patrick Street. But upon reflection, I think the name is apt and it says a lot about why we're here today. To properly interpret the history of this site, we must follow that uninterrupted line from the use of this site today and beyond to the use over the last 80 years. That's why we're here today. That's the lineage of this site. As part of federal regulations, which require the history of this site to be preserved, Alexandria residents had a robust and engaging dialogue about how to recognize the significance of 20th century resources that were built for everyday people as wartime housing. Most of the discussion about Ramsey Homes has been robust and engaging. The preservation conversation provided insight into these homes and the African-American residents who lived here over time. The 2018 demolition marked a significant change on this block and kicked off a period of intensive study of the ground, the architecture during demolition, and the search for understanding who lived in the buildings over a half century ago. As part of this community dialogue, uh, many folks have visited the site as part of the deconstruction tour and are hired consultants to more fully research and tell the story of public housing in the 20th century Alexandria. Today, the symposium panelists will explore the history of public housing, the genealogy of early residents, and the building's unique construction and place in architectural history. The symposium will conclude with a virtual experience of the lineage on North Patrick Street. Um, our speakers today grapple with the history of housing accessibility and segregation and their impacts on African-American residents in Alexandria. Other explore the evolution of the site over time, dating back to the 1830s, the residents who knew the buildings as homes and the innovative architecture that was used to construct Ramsey homes. This symposium, re this symposium represents the culmination of an extensive historic preservation work as part of the Ramsey Homes redevelopment process and the section 106 process as required by federal law. Since the site's history includes its role as public housing, the redevelopment qualified as a federal undertaking, which triggered this consideration of the effects of the project on historic resources. Throughout the section 106 process, 
many community members participated in public meetings and helped identify ways to mitigate the effects of the demolition of these buildings, which was outlined in an MOU that was signed by the consulting parties. The agreement charted the course for how to preserve the history of Ramsey Homes for future generations to come, including the research that's being presented at this forum today. Signs about the history of this site will be installed when construction is completed. The Ramsey Homes Development Project, Redevelopment Project, is situated in the heart of the Uptown Parker Gray Sports District, across the street from Charles Houston Recreation Center, the location of the original Parker Gray School, and next door to Alexandria's Black History Museum, which was formerly the segregated Robert H. Robinson Library, and the Watson Reading Room. Ramsey Homes was one of several low-income housing projects that was built in Alexandria from the 1940s to the 1960s. Ramsey's home, Ramsey Homes was a, built a, initially as a military housing, as military housing under the Lanham Act, as I mentioned earlier, for African-American defense workers, featuring a modern design and utilizing new concrete building technologies. It was acquired by the Housing Authority and for decades has served as homes to hundreds of Alexandrians. Today, we hope that the symposium gives residents and visitors the opportunity to reflect on and learn more about this difficult history of race relations in Alexandria and the country, and how to document the history, especially as we work toward achieving race and social equity in our All Alexandria Initiative. I wanna thank you all uh, for participating in this. I hope you find it a rewarding experience all day. And I especially wanna thank all those who pulled this event together, all those who you'll be hearing from later today who make this event so special. Thank you very much for being here, I appreciate it. And thank you, Eric. <laughs> yes, thank you, um, Mr. Mayor. Um, our next speaker is Helen McElveen, the Director of the Office of Housing. Um, who happens to be my boss. So I can tell you she is an inspiration to all of us in our office to come to work and help Alexandria Lee tirelessly and in many different ways. Off to you, Helen. Thank you, Eric. And what Eric has not told you is that he served as the project manager of the city's section 106 process, including the engagement with residents and stakeholders that resulted in a consensus on how to memorialize the cultural and historic significance of Ramsey Homes. I wanna thank him and the many community members who participated, as well as our colleagues from the Office of Historic Alexandria and the Black History Museum, who have organized this important and timely symposium. Today's symposium is being recorded and it will be an amazing resource uh, to advance the conversation of many local groups who are now studying Alexandria's practices of systemic racism in, in response to the racial injustices witnessed through mass protests nationwide last year and city council's recent adoption of a resolution committing all Alexandria to racial and social equity. As we learn together, understanding and acknowledging our history is the first step to imagining a more equitable future. So I've been asked to give uh, a little bit of a uh, history of the process and um, it's very hard to follow. Mayor Wilson is the speaker, but uh, I'm glad to share um, our experience and our uh, city colleagues in this process, of course, were Carl Moritz and uh, our staff from the Department of Planning and Zoning. So I'm glad to be with you to commemorate Ramsey Holmes's role in providing housing for many people who contributed to Alexandria's story and our nation's story, including defense during war, and to celebrate Ramsey Holmes's transformation as the lineage. As conceived by ARHA, the lineage replaces 15 deeply affordable homes that existed on the site as public housing for nearly seven decades, and also adds 37 new rental homes for households with low, moderate, and workforce incomes. The lineage with its mix of affordability supports Alexandria's values as a diverse, inclusive and welcoming community, which offers access to housing opportunity for all. The lineage also fulfills the city and ARHA's joint commitment that all ARHA owned housing, which is demolished, be replaced on a one-to-one -one basis. So today I thank and congratulate ARHA CEO Keith Pettigrew, his staff, 
and the ARHA Board of Commissioners for their partnership, vision, tenacity, and perseverance. Ramsey is among several sites which ARHA owns, at one time considered to be on the wrong, wrong side of the tracks in a segregated Alexandria, which are now highly valued for residential development because of their transit-oriented locations in neighborhoods of opportunity. If you look at how our city has evolved, ARHA exemplifies uh, the aphorism of what it is to be the change you seek. Beginning with Quaker Hill in the 1990s, long before the rest of the country understood the power of mixed income development to positively change the lives of residents, ARHA, with support from the city and private development partners, created a model which has been subsequently refined and replicated successfully at Chatham Square, at Alexandria Crossing in Orlandria, at Old Town Commons where James Bland used to be, and now at the Lineage. The model replaces obsolescent public housing with new housing and adds other affordable and market rate housing too to create an, an intentional community where people with different lived experiences, perspectives, and yes, different incomes, choose to live together and enrich one another in ways that really matter. ARHA's vision for Ramsey Homes was honed during its strategic planning effort nearly 10 years ago. And it was much more aspirational than the modest future imagined for the site in the city's 2008, 2008 Braddock Metro neighborhood plan. But even ARHA, which removed Ramsey Homes from its 2014 request for proposals from development partners, uh, because, and these are words that uh, were written in an email that I received at the time, because it was a small, straightforward project that ARHA could self-develop, might have abandoned its vision for Ramsey if it had foreseen the long road ahead, uh, which is realized now more than eight years later. In the years since ARHA began redevelopment of Ramsey homes, there has been much discussion, debate, and even division among, among members of our community about how the project should proceed. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, after uh, demolition was proposed, Arha and city staff spent more than a year analyzing the feasibility of preserving one or more of the original Ramsey homes. Arha's architects created many design concepts and revised them many times. The Board of Architectural Review evaluated concepts and offered feedback to foster their appropriateness. City Council solicited and weighed interests of neighbors and stakeholders and ultimately approved ARHA's development plan, which required demolition of the existing structures. Different financing models were studied and ARHA was successful in securing a, an award of competitive tax credits. This equity, along with substantial investments from the city and from ARHA, as well as financial support from Virginia Housing and bridge financing from Capital One allowed construction to finally move forward. But there have been no shortcuts or savings since the project got underway. Site work commenced during the rainiest summer in recent history and the building will be delivered one year into a global pandemic which has affected every aspect of its completion, including uh, the ability to staff the on-site work, the requirements to maintain stringent COVID protocols to keep everyone safe on site, the complex remote coordination among subcontractors and partners, and supply chain delays of critical materials. ARHA has persisted through all of these challenges because it knows that housing affordability uh, that the housing affordability being created here is desperately needed. The lineage has been fully leased since marketing began, including with many of the residents who were relocated during construction 
and who are now choosing to return home. And if we need, or, and if we need further proof of housing need, uh, we heard at AHAC last week that when ARHA opened its waiting list for public housing and housing choice vouchers for three days in January, it received more than 45,000 applications online. So as Alexandria's housing director, I thank ARHA for remaining aspirational in setting goals and steadfast in reaching them. The city is excited to see the lineage now almost complete and to support ARHA's upcoming collaborations with development partners to transform other ARHA housing. From the results of last month's application process, it would appear that 45,000 families are depending on you. In closing, I would like to share a quote that I think aptly characterizes Arha's experience with Ramsey Homes. The right thing to do and the hard thing to do are usually the same. City Council's deliberations leading to the project's approval were ultimately informed by Arha's position that the best way to acknowledge the people who have made their homes at Ramsey was not by preserving physical structures, but by creating more new housing of a quality and type that meets the needs of its future residents, honors their dignity, and both makes and holds space for them in a neighborhood of opportunity. I thank Arha for leading us to do the right thing and for sticking with the hard thing. And I look forward to the virtual tour this afternoon. Congratulations, Arha. I would like to now introduce you to Anna Moss. Anna has worked and volunteered in cultural resources management for nearly 20 years and currently serves as the lead architectural historian and preservation planner at the Environmental Research Group, LLC. She attained a bachelor's degree in architectural history, a minor in architecture, a master's degree in urban and environmental planning, and a certificate in historic preservation from the University of Virginia, during which time she interned at the Virginia Department of Historic Resources and for the city of Charlottesville. This background and her subsequent work in consulting has allowed her to develop a broad range of expertise ranging from the history of vernacular and high style American architecture and landscapes to land use, planning, zoning, and social justice issues. She's contributed to archeological documentary studies, architectural surveys, interpretation plans, and national register nominations related to a wide variety of African-American resources, including the Alfred Street Baptist Church here in Old Town Alexandria, a dwelling site for enslaved laborers in Loudoun County, Reconstruction era farms in Fairfax County and 19th and 20th century suburban neighborhoods in Arlington. In addition to consulting, Ms. Moss volunteers with local chapters of the Habitat for Humanity and the Garden Club of Virginia and has served on the boards of Preservation Kentucky and Preservation Action, as well as terms on her local architectural review board and planning commission here in Virginia. In preparation for the redevelopment of Ramsey Homes, Thunderbird Archaeology, where Anna previously worked, a division of Wetland Studies and Solutions Inc., prepared extensive architectural and archaeological studies in compliance with City of Alexandria ordinances requirements, as well as the Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. Ms. Moss will speak on the results of those studies, outlining the history of the site from its settlement before the Civil War to its eventual role in Alexandria's public housing after World War II. Documentary research and archeological investigations revealed a notable pattern as the site transitioned from vacant land to military housing to affordable housing in two cycles. During her talk, she will touch on the context of these developments and share historic imagery and records, as well as architectural and archeological photo documentation from the investigations. Her work places Ramsey Homes in the context of 20th century housing and public housing in Alexandria, Virginia. The title of her presentation is The Evolution of the Ramsey Homes Site, circa 1834 to 2018. I will now turn the Zoom webinar over to Anna and please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. 
Thank you, Catherine, for the introduction. And thank you to the city for inviting me to present amongst such a great slate of speakers. I really enjoyed Dr. Moon's talk and look forward to um, the upcoming sessions. As Catherine noted, a lot of this was um, prepared through Thunderbird Archaeology. Um, it was prepared in anticipation for redevelopment of the site, um, which required the documentary study and the architectural documentation. And here's a list of the reports and a link that you can find that I think the moderator will share. The archaeological survey goals were to learn more about the people who lived there before the Civil War and after the Civil War, as well as to verify that the maps prepared during the war were accurate um, and to determine more about the soldiers that may have lived there during that time. The architectural survey goals were to identify architectural drawings from its construction, the materials used, and to determine what alterations occurred over time. And then we were able to develop a historic context to evaluate the significance of the buildings and prepare architectural documentation. So our first um, big study was the documentary study, which um, again is required for when a site plan is submitted for redevelopment in, um, in the city in anticipation of archeological digs. Um, this, as Catherine mentioned, showed the cyclical pattern of being vacant and then being tenant housing, um, wartime housing, again, vacant tenant housing and wartime housing. The earliest landowners we were able to identify were um, Francis Swan and Samuel Snowden and his son Edgar Snowden. Um, if you see, this block was created as early as 1785. Um, but like if you're familiar with the comprehensive plan of a city, like a future land use plan, this was not actually constructed for many decades. It was just speculation and was um, popular investment land. Um, we know that Swan and Snowden didn't live there based on how much land they own in other parts of the city. Um, Snowden was a founder of the Alexandria Gazette. Swan had a lot of legal issues dealing with land. Um, he owned quite a bit around Potomac Yard. So we believe they left that undeveloped and then um, we find our first evidence of development in 1834. Uh, George Blish, a German immigrant, came to America, and we know from the deed that he was not allowed to purchase it as a non-citizen. So he went into an agreement in 1834 with David Apak to rent the east side of the block, which did not include Ramsey Homes. Um, so we believe he lived on the Alfred Street side. And Within two years, he did achieve citizenship. He bought that part of the block. And then by 1839, he bought the Ramsey home site, except for a small piece that Edward Snowden still owned. Um, if you look to the right, we, um, we looked up the tax records to determine what was on the site. So we begin with the chain of title, which is we go into the courthouse, find the deeds, um, create, this chain of who owned the properties. And then we dig into the tax records to see who actually was living there and what might be there. And we're lucky Alexandria just has a plethora of archives that make research easy and fun in the area. So um, in 1834, you still have um, Francis Swan, as I mentioned, on the west side, which is Ramsey home site, and it shows that there's nothing there, half a square, which is what they refer to as um, blocks. Um, on the east side, George has a house, and he also is taxed for two enslaved laborers, a horse, five cows, and a cart, also known as a dray, which indicates that he was um, farming on this land. And if you look in census records from 1850, it's notable that 
every single person in his neighborhood is listed as a farmer or a gardener. Um, and so these folks would have maintained very small, what were called market gardens on the squares or blocks that they owned. And then they would carry it into closer into town down King Street on these um, drays. The one pictured here is more likely one associated with a brewer rather than um, a market gardener. And so comparing the deeds, the tax records and the census, we see that he lived there with his wife, Teresa and his son, William, who is old enough to also be listed as a farmer and um, his younger children, Mary, Andrew and George. And unfortunately we weren't able to identify names of the enslaved laborers there at the time. By 1849, Blish is um, acquired more land in the neighborhood and he remains and continues to operate a market farm. Um, but he sells this block to Henry Dangerfield, who was uh, one of the wealthiest men in Alexandria. He was basically your modern day developer who would have owned um, a wholesale warehouse downtown. Um, and he seems to have purchased this just again as investment property because he lives six blocks to the south. Um, and as Dr. Moon mentioned, this kind of fits that um, customary segregation where you had um, the wealthy landowners living very nearby to the African-American residents. Um, so you see in, when he first gets it in 1849, he's just renting the whole square to one person Aaron Knight, and then in the following year, John Foster is renting it. He is taxed um, for himself and one other, as well as two enslaved laborers. Um, it, there's not a lot of evidence of him continuing, continuing with the market garden um, because he doesn't have very much equipment. Uh, so it's interesting by 1852, you have one house and all of these Irish immigrants living there. So it, it seems they were renting rooms. And as mentioned with um, Blish, I think this kind of served as a midway point for them um, purchasing property while um, waiting to become a citizen. Uh, because some of them do, if for instance, Michael McSherry is, um, has enough funds to be taxed for two enslaved laborers. Um, so it seems that their renting the room wasn't necessary re reflection of their uh, ability, wealth status. Um, oh, sorry. And then we have, it seems because Michael McSherry is there consistently through the years, he could have been the property manager collecting rents for Dangerfield and he is the one to eventually acquire a horse, cow, and uh, dray. So there is um, strong evidence that he would have continued to operate a market garden as his primary source of income. In 1861, uh, the United States took over all of Alexandria. So on May 24th, Virginia voted to secede, and the same night, 10,000 troops marched and voted over from DC into Alexandria. Uh, they set up shop in the warehouses and the rail yards. And with this site, they left it vacant for a couple of years. Um, it would seem this bird's eye view of Alexandria is 1863 and doesn't show anything there. So it may just had not included a lot of detail on this block or it may be indicative of when the four houses were taken down and the site was prepared for um, the Union Army to occupy it. Because in 1863, they, the quartermaster did assign Battery H of the Pennsylvania Independent Light Artillery to the site to operate um, a hospital and have barracks. So on the Ramsey home site, this great map, uh, which has a lot of a uh, detail, mentions that there is a big vegetable garden on Patrick Street. 
there is a two-story headquarters with one-story wings on the north, south, and west, and then a large veranda on the east overlooking a big grass lawn and um, that is flanked by two barracks. And the barracks extend into what is now an alley. Also, um, there is a blacksmith and kitchen to the east of the barracks. We also have um, a sutler's private residence down in the southwest corner um, with along with a privy. And to the east of that, again, in the alley, we have a small hospital and a hospital tent. And then there's large stables over where the Blish residence would have formerly been on Alfred Street. Um, what is notable about this is the private sutler's house was probably one of the tenant houses because sutlers were, which were civilian merchants, much like um, someone who operates a Navy exchange or a commissary, they um, sold everything from stationery, sewing kits, tobacco, toiletries, basically anything a soldier would need in the field. They usually set up in tents, but um, the location in this house made us think that um, it was reuse of something that was there. Um, also, we think that the privy could still be there um, under the sidewalk and an area that we weren't able to excavate. Um, sellers were also known to sell illegal things. Um, an example of this was described as hoop skirts and unregistered pistols that weren't issued by the army. They were kind of maligned and loved because it was a great social center for the soldiers, um, but they also tended to hike prices and have a monopoly, particularly in rural areas. It may not have been quite such an issue here in Alexandria with other um, merchants in the area. Fortunately, um, no one died in combat as they were really just there to guard the trains um, and one person did die at the site of disease. At war's end, all of the property in Alexandria was returned to the original owners if they had kept up with their taxes. Um, we have the Dangerfield uh, receiving this. Henry Dangerfield died shortly after the war. So uh, in 1870, his properties were divided among his widow and children and his daughter Ellen received this block. We uh, dug into the selected tax records for this until we found the year that um, house appeared again. So uh, there was no house listed in taxes until 1880, though this 1877 map of the block does show four buildings and the two in the Ramsey home site area very much look like the sutlers and headquarters footprints though shifted to the north. And this could still be accurate because as I mentioned, a lot of these blocks were undeveloped at the time and the roads had not been surveyed. It was very common to find buildings in the middle of the roads on the outskirts of the city or the old town part of the city. Um, so it is possible that this was constructed in that way. We did not find a lot about Frank Penn, Henry Parsons, or Edward Hawk. We found their names in the city directory, but no information um, in the census. And as mentioned, this was just still largely undeveloped about, it had kind of a patchwork feel, the whole region without a unifying character at this point. After um, Ellen Dangerfield sold the property, it was owned by four people and it remained undeveloped for almost 50 years. Um, at this time, the area was fairly integrated uh, because people, there wasn't formal segregation laws quite yet in the late, late 19th century. Um, the, People came to the area to work in the railroads or the Belfry Bottle Company or Alexandria Glass Company. 
um, Uptown was a small, Uptown Parker Gray, um, as it is now known, was a small community closer to the town that was historically black, but it grew to 24 city blocks within this time period and had resources such as libraries, clubs, and schools for the black community. Um, and then in 1920, as all schools were being consolidated around Virginia, um, and there was major education reform throughout the state, uh, the state hired um, state architects for education, and they started building these schoolhouses. And of course, um, as Dr. Newman mentioned, there wasn't equality in how they were actually built. You had everyone, all the Black families coming from all over the city to this one location, just north of Ramsey site homes. And then uh, you start to see subdivision as this housing crisis of, emerges, particularly um, a lot of the housing shortages can be pinpointed to uh, World War I and um, Jim Crow laws being instituted by this time. So the area definitely became more segregated and finding housing became very difficult for the African-American community. So this shows half of the block was uh, developed by this time. And this was Blish's old property, but the four owners of the Ramsey site homes just left these as a vacant subdivision. And here we get to the um, conception of the Ramsey homes. Um, this was, as mentioned, housing shortages began earlier in the 20th century and became unbearable by the 1940s. They um, had white and black military employees living in temporary camps. Here's an image of the um, Arlington, Virginia FS a trailer camp project for Negroes in a single type trailer in 1942. So they began looking to build um, military housing and being in such a segregated era, um, looked to the historically black neighborhoods for the black, black housing and then the white neighborhoods for the white housing. We have um, a plan where they're starting to look around in Uptown Parker Gray neighborhood in 1941. Uh, the project is approved in March of that year. And um, by July, they've purchased the four vacant parcels from these property owners. Later in July, we had the first design submitted, which I won't go into a lot of detail, but it's by, because that will be the topic of this afternoon's talk, but by Smith Werner and Billings Architects and Delos H. Smith was a founding member of Alexandria's Board of Architectural Review and notably had up until this point designed almost exclusively in the classical and colonial revival styles. Um, this original plan was modernist in nature and um, was refined by October and resubmitted using an innovative material called Fabcrete that had just been patented. Um, by November 41, it, the contract was awarded and due to its innovation, it and Cameron Valley Homes uh, were featured in architectural record the following year. The first reference we found to the name Ramsey Homes, which was a lot catchier than Lanham Act Alexandria Defense Housing Project, Virginia VA 4144, 133 was in an agency directory in uh, February 24th, 1942. And by October 42, it was 99% complete and six um, units were occupied just after Thanksgiving of that year. An enviable timeline, I'm sure, for ARHA embarking on projects today. And again, I won't go too much into it, but these are the plans, um, one draft of which was supplied by um, ARHA and the other we found in the National Archives in College Park. 
And here's the uh, patent for the materials used, which we found in um, uh, online as fortunately all patents have been digitized. And so by 19, um, the, after the war, the uh, US was looking to offload some of these properties. And this is a reference we found to it in the Negro Yearbook of 1946, which is Advertising Permanent Public Housing Projects. Um, and this was a publication that first appeared in 1912 under Booker T. Washington's direction. And it was supposed to be a one-off publication, but proved to be so valuable for African-Americans moving around the country that um, it continued to be published for many more years. In 46, the Washington Post advertised the sale of the property for $2.7 million. And um, they were unsuccessful in selling it right away. The Public Housing Authority took over. 1947, we found the first appearance of residents in the city directory. And it looks like there's a combination of war workers still there and um, folks who worked in the community. We have Carnell Coffey, who's a USA, and then um, a clerk of the War Department, as well as a barber, an auto mechanic, and a janitor. By 51, the Public Housing Authority did come to an agreement with AHA, which was then known as AHA, um, to convey the low rent housing after what they described as the Korean emergency. And it was officially purchased in 53 by ARHA. They were um, in subsequent years as they did routine maintenance, um, they added elements that obscured the innovative Fab Creek product and flat roofs with um, what was described in a later document as prairie style elements. We have a hipped roof and stucco. And in 1995, additional maintenance uh, added colonial revival elements such as um, fake shutters and picket fences. Uh, also removed a, a play area that was in the original plan, which you can see in the L of the triplex. In 1984, this became part of a local zoning historic district, which um, as I mentioned earlier, that which prompted some of these studies. Um, this was actually met with a lot of protests by residents who were already feeling the pinch of slum clearance, slope so-called slum clearance, otherwise known as urban renewal. They had been protesting that for many years, feeling that uh, housing opportunities were being removed without being replaced. They also associated historic districts with high property values, which you could see in Old Town um, Historic District. And um, ultimately it passed, but um, 2008 to 2010, it was officially recognized by the Virginia Landmarks Register and National Register of Historic Places as a much larger district. And those districts do not have any um, restrictions as related to the um, Board of Architectural Review. So in tandem with this documentary study, we uh, did a traditional historic American building survey um, to assist ARHA in um, preparing for redevelopment. Uh, Offender Board Archaeology prepared the written data. We uh, had Encore Sustainable Design prepare measured drawings. And William Lebovich take large format photography, which uh, is still considered archivally superior by the National Park Service, despite um, amazing progress in digital photography. We took some supplemental color photographs inside the buildings and here I paired them with the original plans. So on the uh, bottom left, you can see the kitchen slash utility room. And to the right is the photograph you see, they have everything just crammed in the washer dryer, um, a closet refrigerator.
here we have a typical first floor living room and you can see the supply plenum up here, which there was this interesting isometric drawing of it in the original plans. Here's the typical first floor with living room with the stairs. And notably there's no bathroom on the first floor, which was a major issue um, and for residents and another reason Arha wanted to redevelop. Here's the second floor. You see the one bathroom that serves the whole um, unit and uh, two bedrooms. And here are the archival photographs prepared. Building one, three, and four are um, all essentially identical. Uh, the one on the left is on Patrick and Wythe, and the one on the right is on Patrick and Pendleton. And because those three buildings were essentially identical, Encore Sustainable Design created um, just one set of drawings for that building. And these were prepared to have standards. And here again is um, the floor plan, which is basically unchanged from when it was first built in the 40s. And here we have the triplex, uh, which, as I mentioned, this L would have ha had a paved play area, I think, up into the, the 1990s, and it was tucked away in the alley. So it did create some privacy for the residents. And there's the um, Habs drawings of the triplex. So with that, we move on to the archeological field results. Uh, we did a combined phase one, phase two. Uh, the documentary research suggested that people use the site from the early 1800s to the early 1900s. However, there wasn't one completely intact site associated with a certain era, likely due to disturbances related to building Ramsey homes and um, and just the evolution of the site as you've seen. And here this map, you can see where they found positive shovel tests versus um, test units that didn't reveal anything. There were a lot of glass artifacts, probably the most, um, and there was a lot of machine made glass. And here's a sampling of items found. We have a clear fasted gemstone, um, turquoise fasted jewelry, oh, excuse me, um, a bitters bottle fragment from 62 to 80, a black wine bottle lip, and some um, aqua medicinal bottle from 1810 to 1860. And it's notable with all of these archaeological finds that the date you see in parentheses after is the manufacturing date. So not necessarily when it was used, um, it's particularly with ceramics or what we just call our dishes. They um, would have been used for many years after manufacture date due to heirloom pieces, secondhand pieces, that sort of thing. And here is an example of your formal china and your everyday dishes. You have canary yellow glazed creamware from um, dating back to a manufacture date of 1762, mocha pearlware from the 19th century, overglazed blue hand painted, hand painted hard paste porcelain pre-1880, blue transfer printed whiteware, from the mid 19th century, mulberry transfer printed whiteware, and polychrome hand painted and undecorated yellowware. Again, this is all the evidence we use to make that determination that it was occupied just in the um, from the early to mid 19th century to the early 1900s. And we did find in the phase 
one to uh, survey actual the evidence of Civil War occupation with this general service button that was first in use in 1854 and a fired mini ball fragment. These items could have been used by tenants or soldiers. You have clothing, toy, and tobacco artifacts, a um, brass stone button, two molded pipe bowls and a pipe stem, as well as an earthenware marvel. Once um, phase two commenced and Arha received uh, their approval to redevelopment, we got into phase three archaeological field results um, doing data recovery after uh, much of the housing was Ramsey houses were removed. And during phase three, most artifacts recovered were thought to be pre-Civil War, while some were related to post-Civil War, and then even fewer were actually um, could be traced to Union occupation. In addition to the artifacts, we found features confirming the presence of buildings. Um, and to your left, you see this dark coloration in the soil. That's indicative of a post hole. And post holes, um, there were several of these throughout the site. And this could have been um, related to the barracks, which you can see here from this example from the Slough Hospital in Alexandria that um, they were built on post with the flooring set on top. Also, it could have been related to tents. Some of the post holes could have been related to tents. This is a typical settler's tent in Petersburg. Um, also would have been similar to what the hospital tent would have looked like. Here's another feature found, which could have been uh, related to the tenants or the soldiers that have brick fragments and oysters, and oysters are a very common find being so close to the Potomac. This was an interesting feature of cobblestones, and it ran around a lot of the site. Uh, in 1861, the U.S. Sanitary Commission uh, inspected several camps and found that they had foul odors and uh, sinks and not enough ventilation, disease, all sorts of issues. Um, so they instituted using a drainage system on the periphery of the camps. And uh, we believe this is part of that. It would have been used as trash pits by uh, the neighborhood in later decades. Amongst the artifacts, we found just more of your tableware that um, is common in these sites. And these have very early manufacturer dates, but again, may have been used well into the um, 19th century. There's hand-painted Chinese porcelain, um, hand-painted and shell edge pearlware, multi-chambered slip ware, transfer printed ware, um, pearlware and transfer printed whiteware. And this last one is a um, possible reddish. Of the items that could have been tenant or um, this is a mixture of definitively military and some that could have been either tenant or military. For instance, the brass New York militia button, uh, the brass general service button, another brass button, and then um, down below we have these beads, buttons, and thimbles that are less definitively military. These personal and toy artifacts seem to be um, more likely related to the tenants with the brass clutch purse frame, a slate pencil, and two copper alloy one cent coins. We have the molded stoneware toy cup, a limestone marble, and a stone marble. Here we found a stoneware inkwell, which um, generally it's hard to date stoneware because they were produced forever. So we just applied this date because of the other evidence. 
And here it's more evidence of the military occupation. The three lead mini balls, one Colt bullet, and then one unidentified lead bullet from another time period. Ever popular was smoking. The, here we have another pipe bowl and stem fragments. And last but not least, our most ornate find was this anthropomorphic pipe bowl fragment um, seen in, uh, we sent to several experts and they tend to agree that it is likely French and from the mid to late 19th century. So it too could have been a tenants or a soldiers. And with that, I'll conclude and ask for any questions or answers. Here's the list of the reports again in that link. Um, thank you so much. Anna, thank you so much for um, sharing all of your research. Um, that's really interesting, especially all the findings um, that you, uh, the archeology span um, showed. I have a few questions that have come through on the chat. And so I will start asking those. I encourage everybody to please um, send through your questions um, to ask. We are not using the raised hand function. So just put them in the chat. From Peggy Brown, uh, she noted that Park Fairfax was built for Pentagon workers during World War II. Was it segregated when it was first built? Where did most of the Ramsey home residents work during World War II? Thank you. Um, unfortunately, I can't speak to Park Fairfax um, as it was outside of the um, study, but um, because we weren't able to find directories for actually during the war, we don't know where the Ramsey Homes residents um, worked specifically. Um, as I mentioned, the first evidence of them in a directory was 1947. And it just mentioned vaguely um, the uh, war clerk and then someone listed occupation as USA. But hopefully that is something as with our next talk, um, maybe with oral history, we can find more about. Great, thank you. Yes, I'm hopeful um, that we'll learn a lot more. Um, we've gotten two questions regarding um, from Martha Harris and from Jim Neighbors about um, how was the name Ramsey Homes specifically decided and selected? That's another one where we searched and searched and searched and could not find it. Um, we know we have that, um, the landmark Ramsey House in Alexandria, but we couldn't make a connection to that. It didn't make sense. Um, and kind of scoured some Black history documents through um, National Archives and looking at some oral histories that had already been collected through the Black History Museum. Um, it just, it everywhere we looked was a dead end, unfortunately. All right. Um, are there any other um, questions that are coming through? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll wait a moment for um, to see if some of those um, come through now. Um, but in the meantime, I will ask, um, Anna, do you have any insight into why a modern design might have been selected for this project, um, noting especially this is a relatively small um, wartime housing project. M many of them were much larger in scale. So do you have any insight into why a modern design would be created? Because it looks like a lot of, in our area, a lot of the um, wartime housing was very much colonial revival in style. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um it's a little bit of conjecture, but um, based on patterns with the school buildings, for instance, um, I do know that the state architect specifically frequently did simpler designs for the African American community, basically because, you know, separate but equal was a theory and never really applied. And so they would just go with the cheapest version for. Um, a black community. So I think that um, there's reason to believe that didn't just occur in 
the schools, but also in housing, that it would have been a lot cheaper to build this precast um, building in a very minimalistic style um, in this neighborhood um, as it cheaper than it would be to apply all the, you know, colonial revival um, woodwork and that sort of thing on the exterior of a building. And also, I think that the talk this afternoon, we'll get more into this, just public housing trends in Europe were starting to trickle into the United States. Um, so I think there was some inspiration on that end. And truly, I just think it was an affordability issue. And as we discovered between the two plans that I showed, um, there was, we found other documentary evidence that there were a lot of letters going back and forth of value engineering, like how can we make this cheaper, redesign it, remove that, that's all well and good, but we don't really wanna pay for that um, when it came down to the final design. Another question that's come through is, um, what exactly is the Fabcrete? Fabcrete was a precast unit, sort of like our um, concrete blocks today that housing is um, built with. And uh, there was a big movement in the early 20th century where engineers were constantly patenting these new innovative precast blocks where you could um, they were made off site and brought to a construction site and could be um, constructed really rapidly. Um, so it was just one of many patents that were out there at the time. And again, I think this afternoon they're going to really get into that um, topic. Um, so this one was patented by a guy in Richmond right uh, in 1939 and approved right as this was being constructed. Wonderful. And I'm getting a couple of notes on the chat that um, the third and final session this afternoon will go into um, great detail and a great overview of Fabcrete. So if you can join in there and just a reminder that these will be um, that session will also be recorded. Um, another question that we got from um, Elizabeth Brooks Evans asks um, whether your research went a little bit farther south from the Ramsey homes to the to Princess Street, the 900 block. Um, this woman says that her grandfather built a house in the 900 block around 1917. <clears throat> so did your research go there or um, wh where could we learn more about that? We did not get into a lot of detail um, on any of the sites itself. Um, a good resource to start with is the Parker Gray Uptown Historic District nomination from 2008, which covers the whole neighborhood. But um, in particular with that house, I would say that if you wanna learn more, going to the Alexandria Courthouse once um, it's open again, there are very helpful people in there that can help you find, uh, create a chain of title and learn more about the property. Also the Barrett Branch Library has amazing resources and um, if you they have um, a series of binders with photographs of almost everything in Alexandria and you can search by street. Um, I would also talk to the Barrett Branch folks. They're very helpful in doing that kind of research. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, a question has also come through about where will these recordings live? Um, they will live on the City of Alexandria website um, on one of the um, Office of Historic Alexandria pages. We have um, a page dedicated to um, Ramsey Homes that has a lot of these um, documentary studies and research also there. So um, they will be located there. And I think this, um, I think it's going to, the link will be um, inserted into the chat so that you can use that. Um, and look for them to be posted towards the end of the month. So it'll be a few days before they will get, um, they will be loaded there. Um, another question is, did you find anything how um, this site um, or this design and approach relates to any other sites? Was this part of a larger pattern or um, a template that might we might see in other cities with this design and this approach with these 
quad plexes in the modern design? We did not go too far beyond. I know there was um, similar housing, I believe in Arizona, um, but I, I couldn't speak to that. Uh, again, I think that the architecture talk this afternoon will dive, in, dive more into that. Certainly, and we also know how sometimes um, research, there can be more and more, there are always more questions and things to study. So um, that's an example of that um, for sure. I'm going to see if there are any more questions and then um, let um, maybe one question is coming up. Um, do you have questions from John Mullen? Do you have questions about the history of your property, genealogy or local history? Uh, this is, I think, um, an answer to um, the previous woman who was asking about where to learn more about her grandfather's house. Um, the Alexand and there's a note um, in the chat with a link that the Alexandria Library's Local History Special Collections Division is a great place to start that research. So yes, thank you um, for those of us who aren't familiar with using that. Um, they are a great resource. Um, I and guess I'll uh, say. Sorry, um, nope. John Mullen is from Thunderbird Archaeology. So if you had more specific questions about artifacts, maybe he could answer in the chat. We will see if some if, if he has um, can respond. If there are any archaeological questions, put them in the chat. Um, I guess one thing I might ask also is, was there anything that seemed surprising or unusual in your research since you've done so much research in the Virginia, in Virginia, um, was there anything that stood out as surprising or um, unusual here? I would say just um, the design themselves was surprising. Um, and unusual to, to see this housing um, fit into a, histor a historic neighborhood in this way. Um, and I would have associated a project like this with more um, of the outskirts of a neighborhood like this. So I find it uh, fascinating how they integrated it into an existing healthy um, African American community they were at the same time they built two USO clubs. So um, I just always associated a lot of these projects with being in a kind of separate cluster unto themselves. So it was interesting to learn how they wove them into existing fabric. Thank you. That's um, really wonderful. And we appreciate your sharing your findings and your research with all of us. Um, again, um, this recording and um, some of Anna's research reports are also listed on that website that you can get to in the chat. Um, if there are no other questions, um, I just want to remind everybody that we have another speaker who will be um, beginning momentarily. And that um, also there is another session this afternoon. So please make sure to um, sign up um, for that if you haven't yet. And um, I will just note that while these sessions are being recorded, um, we can't, um, the uh, list of participants will not be part of that. Only the panelists um, will be shown on that recording. So um, the, um, the list of panelists, the, the attendees can't see um, who else is attending and um, it won't be part of the recording. Um, I do wanna let everybody know, um, Anna, this was well attended. There are over 90 attendees um, and I, think that everyone's appreciated your um, thoughtful research and insights. At this time, I am going to introduce everyone to Audrey Davis, who I'm sure many of you know, but she is the director of the Alexandria Black History Museum, uh, Alexandria Black History Museum. Audrey? Good morning, everyone. I apologize, I'm having a bit of a uh, bit of trouble with my video, but good morning and thank you for uh, attending today. Uh, we've had a wonderful, uh, wonderful list of uh, speakers today and you're going to enjoy uh, our new speaker, Shara McCargo Ba. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce her and she will be presenting on segregation and wartime housing, the story of the Ramsey homes. 
Shara McCargo Ba is the CEO and owner of Finding Things for You LLC. She is an author of two nonfiction books focused on local histories of African Americans in Alexandria, Virginia. She has appeared in numerous television programs and she has received many awards, including being a 2014 Living Legend of Alexandria. She is currently a freelance columnist for the Alexandria Gazette newspaper and also has two blogs, The Other Alexandria, that you can find at theotheralexandria.com and Finding Things for You at findingthingsforyou.com. We look forward to hearing Shara's presentation about her work discovering the families who live in the Ramsey homes. I've had the privilege of knowing Shara for over, over 20 years, and I'm really looking forward to this talk and this amazing research that she's done. So without further ado, Shara Macago Ba. Thank you. Thank you all, Jerry. Um, I'm on mute. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, I want to thank everyone for joining um, in for my lecture on uh, segregation wartime housing. And um, this picture here that you saw previously with our speaker, Anna, um, the neighborhood in, uh, around Parker Grave was looking similar to this. A lot of, of the African-Americans built their own homes with their own hands. And um, right after slavery, uh, some of them were settled in around that area. Some of them also were, um, like for instance, with the Dangerfields, they were enslaved and stayed, some, stayed around the area and worked for the local people in that area. And then another a group of people who had migrated into Alexandra due to, um, they were contrabands, they were looking for housing. And, and so that area got populated with incomers and also people who were born in Alexandra and um, they populated the Parker Gray area, they built their homes. And over time, these homes um, started uh, dilapidating because they, didn't, they were built out of materials that did not last. So during World War I and World War II, um, Alexandria had a major shortage of homes, even prior to that, because you had people, thousands of people coming in during the Civil War, and Alexandria is not that big, you know. So what happened is that you had a lot of people there living in different places and living in the barracks. When the barracks was no longer available, they had to find, find um, homes to live in. So by, by, the, um, by the 20th century, it was getting to a unbearable uh, situation where these African-Americans really were uh, almost living in squatter areas. Some were living in alleys, um, what we call alleys today. So when the Ra Ramsey Home Project started, it was really started for military and government workers. And you'll find that the first people who moved there basically were working in the government or they were in the military. Um, the Ramsey Homes um, course was constructed around 1941. Um, just like our previous speaker in the city directories, one could not actually find um, documentation um, um, after 1941, 1942, 43. Don't see anyone actually moving in there uh, until you get to the mid uh, 1940s. One of the most difficult parts of this, um, uh, this, this um, during this research, was that there um, there were a lot of obstacles. And I had listed some of the obstacles and doing, doing um, the research and locating the descendants. And uh, there was no city listing of the early occupants from 1942 to 1965. City listing meaning that when I took on this project, the Alexander Housing Authority did not have a list of names of people who actually lived there. They did not have a list from 1942 to 1965. I had to identify who those people were. And once I identified them, I was able to research. Identifying them took time, lots of time. 
It's like having nothing and making something out of nothing. And that's what I had to do. So the occupants did not appear in the 1940 census. Basically when you're researching, especially back um, um, in the early 20th century, um, you're gonna first think, in my case, I will look at the, the census to see what the neighborhood looked like, see who was living there. I didn't have that because many of the people didn't show up on a, on a census because I did not know their names. <laughs> they didn't show up and, uh, uh, on the 1940 census. So I couldn't use that as a resource. Then the occupants did not appear on the 1942 city directory. Um, the directory is a year older than what it is. A year, uh, um, not a year older, but a, um, the information is taken the year before. So if it's a 1942 city directory, that information really is 1941 because you have to gather the information and then you have to publish it. So that information was gathered prior to 1942 to go into the 1942 uh, directory. Um, many of the occupants were deployed to Alexandria. They came from different places uh, to come to um, the um, Washington DC area to work. And so they were not known by other Alexandrians if they came from someplace else. Many of the older African-Americans that I consulted with did not know who some of the people were that lived there because they came from someplace else. Many of the occupants were part of the great migration era. And so some came, they worked, but they continued after they got out of the military, they end up leaving and going to other places um, for, more, for better jobs. Um, and many ended up in, nor in other Northern cities. Some occupants were deployed overseas or to other states and never returned to Alexandria. So that was one of the obstacles. Once I identified them, I might not be able to locate their descendants because they never, when they left Alexandria, was deployed someplace else, they never returned. So I had to basically look at this in a, in a national way and an international way to see could I locate where they went and who are their descendants if they are not living. Some occupants um, isolated themselves from their neighbors. So they lived at the Ramsey homes. Some of them were in the military um, and um, they did not make any friends in the area. So that was also an obstacle because my first thing is, is what church did they go to? Are they on any church rosters and everything? I only found um, a few of them I was able to identify uh, what church they um, attended. Um, also, there was a stigma of the Ramsey homes becoming public housing. When you talk to the descendants of today, many do not want to talk to you about it. They look at their period of time that their family lived there as being in public housing. They did not know the history about the Ramsey homes. And so um, they are more affluent today and therefore they did not wanna be associated with something that had that type of stigma. So getting them to come forward, getting them to engage in a conversation was very challenging. Um, low to slow responses from former occupants and descendants. Once I located them, many did not return calls. I will call, call, call. And <clears throat> again, referring back to the stigma of the Ramsey homes becoming um, public housing. Uh, a national wide search for formal occupants and descendants. I looked, I, I broadened my search and was successful with it. Um, I, I am continuing to build the occupants list. I have identified 35 families who lived there. And what also slowed me down was the COVID-19. Going into institutions, doing the research was, um, was um, challenging during this period of time. <sighs> and as you've seen in other lectures, this is um, um, one of the Ramsey homes. The location in any research that I, I take on, I have to get a, um, what I call lay of the land. I have to visually see how things were. Did the neighbors in 914 
communicated with the neighbors over here on Pillington Street at 915. Sometimes when I'm talking to descendants, the more I know about the neighborhood, the more I know about the neighbors, because many of the descendants, they were children living with their parents there. And so when I find them and I talk to them, they might not know the adults, but if I knew that 914 had a little girl there named Susan, 915 Pillington Street might have played with that child and therefore that jogs their memory. So I take uh, a length of time in really finding out uh, as much as I can, um, looking at the neighborhood, finding out what activities were around and um, then using that to be able, once I find a descendant, to be able to use that as a talking piece to get that descendant um, memory um, flowing to back to that period of time. Um, these are the, uh, um, the addresses that were that, um, that I did research on to be able to, look, um, to get the names, to build that list of names of people who lived there. And these are the people that I located. The ones that are highlighted in yellow are the ones I'm gonna focus on for this lecture. But um, taking the first one here, um, Howard, and um, you can see he was there for just a year, 1946 and 1947, more like 1945 because it was from the city directory. And it's a year old before the information is a year old before it actually get into the city directory. So chances are he was there in 1945. Okay, and then we have Edward here. He was, um, the information that I had on him at the time, he was a laborer, but it was 1949. He could have been in the military um, and, or his wife could have. I found women who were actually working in the government and maybe they got into the Ramsey home simply because they were a government employee and not that necessarily they worked in the federal government. But majority of the people had been in the military or worked for the federal government. Um, I'll talk about him more when I um, do, um, later on in this lecture. She was a widow. Her husband was a, um, he was in the army, but, he, um, but she was listed as a widow, so he, uh, he died overseas. Now, something about when a when a military person dies overseas, sometimes the death certificate is not doesn't somehow uh, is sent back to be in local records the way we normally get records in the uh, genie world. And um, sometimes we won't get the documentation exactly when he died, but she is listed as a widow. <clears throat> And then we have Samuel Atkins. Uh, most African-Americans who grew up in Alexandria know the Atkins family are connected to Alfred Street Baptist Church. Another thing, knowing of the local history of the people that you're researching helps you to, um, helps you to um, be able to find descendants. Um, so once I know the church, once I know the lay of the land um, and, um, um, a, and know about the segregation period of time when things were separate, separate. For instance, Parker Gray, I have a pretty good chance that I can find, find an individual. Um, he worked for um, this company at the time he was, um, he was living in the Ramsey homes. Horace Tate's, now there's a lot of Tate's, Tate's that live in Alexandria today, but I believe Horace had mentioned that he that he came from uh, North Carolina. Um, he was a construction worker at the time he was living there. Again, all of these dates really refer to a year before because they were in the city directly at that time, but it, chances are um, the information that was reported was reported, it was a year old by the time it got into the city directory. I noticed that Anna had listed cough, um, coffee uh, interesting. I was able to get a lot of information on on him. I found out where he where he ended up migrating from, and I'll talk about that later in the lecture. I got everything, but I couldn't get the descendants to communicate with me, <laughs> and that's what I'm still working on. That I don't give up, but it, so far I haven't been able to get them to communicate with me. Um, then we have William Fisher. Um, he was um, working at the um, 
Fort Belvoir. Fort Belvoir was a my uh, a lot of the these um, people that actually had jobs at Fort Belvoir, even when they got out of the military, many of them ended up uh, becoming a civilian uh, employee at the Fort Belvoir. Uh, Logan, he uh, he was a, he tended um, he was an attendant for uh, for Virginia Motors, and then Will Daniels. They are very interesting. Um, they're local people, and um, I had interviewed several people who knows that family, and of course he was a barber, and um, that that made it a little bit better because mean that he came in contact with a lot of people in the community, therefore somebody would have remembered him. He is deceased, but Will Daniels had a son named Willie, and he had a son named Freddie, and um, Freddie is still living today. Freddie has not responded to my calls yet. Freddie lives in North Carolina, and um, I was able to get a telephone number for him and contact him, and I'm still hopeful that he will communicate. Um, what happened is that Willie Daniels and his wife, they lived, um, they, they lived at 611 North Patches Street. Uh, Freddie moves out first and gets married. And then Willie uh, later on gets married and he ends up living also in the, in the Ramsey homes. I think the father and the mother split up and, and Freddie takes, um, he becomes um, the head of household when the father moves out. Then we have George Witherspoon, which I also saw that Anna had him listed as well. And, and he's a mechanic and I have about 1946 on him living there. Arthur Johnson was a government worker and he lived there at 613 North Patrick Street. Then the next list here, I have Olivia Edwards, who was um, husband was Earl. He was a porter and then Cleveland, uh, Tevi, I had very good success with his family, which I'll get into it. I got pictures, I got, um, I talked to the granddaughter. All of his daughters are living, all of his daughters were born in, in um, at um, Walter Reed. They were living in Alexandria because of the segregation. They decided, um, I guess when his wife gave birth, they um, would go to Walter Reed. And um, though they were living in the Ramsey homes during this time period, they, uh, he was in Alexandria in, in, 19, in 1940. He entered the military in 1940. And right after his basic training, he came to Alexandria. He married his wife in 1942. Okay, Richard Cross. The Cross family still, they still, still have relatives of the Cross family living in Alexandria. Richard is deceased. Um, his um, relative um, is B. Taylor. Her, um, I think Richard was her um, uncle. He has a son that lives in Woodbridge. He has not returned my calls yet. And um, he lived there um, during uh, 1949 to 1953. George Carroll um, in the US Army. Richard was in the Navy. And then we have William Campbell also living in the Ramsey Homes, um, U.S. Army. Ray Morton, I um, talked to Ray Morton Jr. And um, because I didn't have access to the 1960 city directory to confirm how long they've been living there, Ray Jr. told me they lived there until 1963. And Ray Jr. lives in Maryland. Lee, I, I don't have pictures yet. He's supposed to be sending me pictures of his dad. And Leroy, he was a driver at Fort Belvoir, living in the Ramsey Homes during this period of time. Warland, he worked for the Alexandria Furniture Store. And I have to confirm, having confirmed whether he was in the military. Some of them were in the military and, and um, they entered in their home state. They were not from, from Virginia. And, um, in locating where they were actually living, um, will give me a um, a um, a draft card on it. Fred Hill, it's the U.S. Army. This is Willie Daniels, and Will, Willie Daniels is Will Daniels' son, and he ended up after he got married living at 623 North Patrick Street 
where his father uh, was living at six. He and his, he was living with his father before getting married, and they were at six eleven. And then um, his father moves out when Freddie gets married, and Freddie takes over. And then Will gets married, and he gets a place at six twenty three. And he's a driver for the Manhattan. Charles E. Smith is a janitor. Some of them were janitors at um, the public school system in Alexandria. Okay, and then we got Carol Lester, and he was in, um, he had been in the military and he was working for a military um, facility. We get here to William Payton, and William Payton is working at Fort uh, Belvoir, Patrick Street. And um, then this person worked for the city of Alexandria. Austin A. Taylor was working for the city of Alexandria. Chen was in the U.S. Army. I'm very aware of the McKnight family. It's a lot of, uh, have a lot of history on the McKnight family. I don't know yet whether any persons with the McKnight surname still living around in Alexandria, but the McKnight family are well known in the Seminary Road area, up in Seminary. And um, he at that time was living at the um, on Patrick Street. Um, Walter was in the U.S. Army during this time. Uh, Fred Patrick was in the U.S. Army. Then we have Lewis jo uh, Jackson worked at the Department of Agriculture, and I don't have an end end year on those two because I need to go back into the um, into an institution and um, check because I don't have the 1960 city directors available to, to me in my databases. So I will, that's something I need to look more into. Johnny Chapman, thought that Johnny might be related to um, Councilman Chapman, but they're not, <laughs> different Chapman. Um, he was a laborer and he lived there also in 1912. Shepard, um, known in especially coming out of Fairfax County, um, this one was in the U.S. Army, and again, I don't have the actual time he was there. Um, or did I miss that? Um, what time he was there? Oh, I do. I forgot to put it in there. Uh, he was there from 1944 to 1945, only for one year. And then uh, Bridge was a school janitor, and he um, was there from 1946 to 1956. He was one of the uh, only a few of them lived that long, um, lived for more than two or three years in the Ramsey homes. Most of them moved out within a year or two. This is Cleveland B. Tibby. I'm gonna focus on, he was in the US Army. He was born in Jamaica and he came to the um, United States as a teenager with his grandmother. His mother was already here in the United States and she was in the military. He, um, he um, this is a, a list of when he was in the CC camp, civilian conservation corps. And um, he lived in Brooklyn, New York. This is um, a Gloria, and, and Cleveland when they got married on July the 3rd, 1942 in the Bronx, New York. While they were living in Alexandria, they had three girls and all three girls are living today. One lives in um, California. One is in, I wanna say New Jersey and the other one is in Alabama, I think. And this was taken in the 1940s. <clears throat> um, Cleveland was, um, this is um, documentation that, um, that he was a clerk for the War Department and he lived at 615 North Patrick Street. We go back to Cleveland a bit. Mm -hmm. um, let me go back for more. Cleveland um, is very interesting. He goes into the army in 1940 and he um, gets out right, um, right, right at, after the um, World War II. 
he is a seven day Adventist, which is very important in his life and important in, his, in the story about him. Cross the street on the corner of Wilf and Patrick, I think it was a seven day Adventist church. And his, his granddaughter believed that's where he probably attended. Remembering her mom saying they attended church in the neighborhood. And um, so anyway, so he was a member of that. He was very much into his faith. After getting out of the military, he enrolled and he takes his GI Bill and he enrolls in college to become a minister. Once he completes his um, de um, degree, he then um, start um, preaching, but, but, he, but he decided later on to become a professor down in Alabama at one of the um, universities that, um, that they have a lot of um, seven-day Adventist um, curriculum there. And he stays there and teach until, um, until basically he ends up, up dying later on. His wife um, goes out to California, stays with her daughter, and that's where she, um, she died. And both of them are, their ashes are there. The granddaughter who I talked to, she lives in Washington, DC. And she was able to give me a lot of information. And I also talked to one of the daughters. I did a telephone call with them and I talked to them on the phone. Lander Hogan. U.S. Army. Now, Landon Hogan is interesting. He makes a complete career out of the military. He's a sergeant in the U.S. Army. He originally was from Little Rock, Arkansas. And he married a, into a well-known African-American family, the Napper family. The Napper family is also, um, they are related to the Kwanda family. And anyone who's living in Alexandria, Fairfax <laughs> County knows the Kwanda family um, and, and part of their history because they have, I think at least have had over 50 or 60 years of having family reunions and they're well known and it's in the Gum Spring area. So Landon Hogan, he was stationed down in Fort Belvoir and in that area and he met Sadie and they got married. In the city directory, 1950, they were living at 915 Pillington Street. Across the street, it was a um, it was a U.S. Army's SC. I mean, what's it called? It was um, an entertainment place where military would go and dance, and this picture was taken there. And that was on Pillington Street. Now it's homes there, but right across the street from the Ramsey homes. This is um, Landa Hogan and Sadie, his wife. When um, Sadie's mother died in um, Gum Spring, her father was left raising the rest of the children. And uh, Sadie and her husband stepped in and they uh, allowed her brother, who is Louis Napper and her sister, Shirley Napper, to come live with them at the Ramsey homes. Louis died two or three years ago, but he, ha he, he uh, has a surviving son named Eric Dwayne Napper. And Eric and his mother live off of Alpha Street. And his mother is from a well-known family called the, the Teller family, last name Teller. And Eric was the one who provided the information for this um, presentation. Shirley is still living. His daughter Shirley is still living as well. Here um, is um, a, um, one, another daughter named Lydia. I think she's living also. And the reason why I say I think, because one of them live in Washington, DC. I can probably ask Eric about that. But anyway, she marries a James Henry Moore and, um, and, and she is the daughter of, um, of um, 
of um she's the daughter of uh Sadie and Lander. And I want to go back and say Shirley is his sister-in-law to Lander and not his daughter. I think Lander only had one daughter, and that was Lydia. So Lydia married James Henry Moore. That's important in a sense because James Henry Moore and Lydia's son works for the Alexandria, Alexandria um, city of Alexandria. And I think they call him, I think his um, nickname is Chucky, Chucky Moore. And so he works uh, for the city of Alexandria. Landon military where he enlisted in 1927 and he gets out in 1957. And after he gets out, he works at Fort Belvoir. This is Landers' death certificate. And it shows that um, the hospital at Fort Belvoir at that time called D. DeWitt Army Community Hospital. He's, he, he was originally from Arkansas. His daughter, Sadie, um, you see, no, his wife, Sadie, is listed here, but his daughter was the informant, Lydia F. Moore. He was, and it's also confirmed that he was a retired U.S. Army Master Sergeant. And he's buried at the Arlington National Cemetery. And this is his headstone along with Sadie. Then we have Cornell um, Kofi, sometimes seen it as just Coffee, and sometimes his first name is spelled a little different as well. He was in the US Army, World War II, and the Korean War. Now, everything that I research on them, I have not been able to talk to any of their descendants. His son has not returned any of my emails yet. And, but everything that I got on them was through, through peer research. <laughs> and this is Cornell when he was in the military, served in World War II and Korea. And this is him um, also. This shows where his name is spelled C-A-R-N-E-A-L. His first wife was named Amanda. He was working, he was a US Army and they were living at 607 North Patrick Street. And this was in 19, this was the 1947 city directory. So the information was 1946. Here is his headstone. Um, basically, they said he enlisted in the army in 1951, and he got out in 1959. What I found out in many cases in the military, if they got out and they decided to re-enlist, then they were given a new enlistment date. For him to be in World War II, chances are he was there in the 1940s. This is his son, Cornell. And um, and this is his son's wife. I got her name under here someplace. Okay. Um, let me go back. I just clicked out the wrong thing. Okay. And um, and this is his son Cornell the third, Cornell the third, and and Cornell's wife, Cornell's children, and grandson. And that is it. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you, Shar. Thank you You're very welcome. much. It's a, a wonderful presentation. And, and it's so interesting to put um, faces to the names that you've researched to see their family pictures. And we do have some questions in the chat. Uh, one, the first question uh, from Martha Harris for you, Shar, is what was the process of applying and selecting residents for the Ramsey homes. Are there any AHA records from this early period? I was not given any records when I, um, when I started researching this project. I basically was asked, was it possible to find descendants? I said, Every, anything is possible. <laughs> and so, um, so I took on the project with nothing. 
I, all of this was peer research. I was given no lists. I just was given a period of time. So I still got 10 more years to work on. My, my, I was hired to research from 1942 to 1965. I only have one person on this list that lived there until 1966. So I have um, I have um, another 10 years to do some research within a 10 year period of time that I'm looking at. And then Char, another question was, and you talked about some of the records. Um, so were you able to check service records for the veterans, draft records, social security, uh, death indexes, and then follow up with those clues? Um, in the research process, first you start with identifying who you're researching. Once you identify who you're researching, then you go after anything and everything that you can, um, you know, um, anything and everything that you can as far as um, trying to um, get as much information you can. One of the problems, because I'm dealing with a lot of migration, you don't know where they came from until you get their name. And even if you get their name, you might not find out right, right away. So, um, so that eliminates some of the records that you can get and some of the places that you can go to get them. And Char, we have a question from Susan Cumby. Uh, besides Marion McKnight, are there any other Ramsey residents related to the Fort community residents from your research? Um, Fort, okay. Mm. Um, not by looking at their, well, maybe the shepherd. I haven't, I haven't, um, maybe the shepherd, because they do come out of Fairfax County, the shepherds. Okay, great. And sir, uh, I know you've, you've published already two books on Alexandria history, but do you have any uh, thoughts about uh, research, I mean, publishing some of this research that you've done on public housing? I was told that the housing, housing, um, Alexandria Housing might publish it, or might, you know, want to have the right to publish it themselves. So. <laughs> and have you, um, did you conduct any research through the pub public housing authorities records and archives when you were doing this project? Well, as far as for what I do, I was told up front they don't have any records on any, you know, they didn't have any names. They have them now since I'm giving it to them, but they didn't have any prior to that. And um, from Gail Rothrock, do you have any info on places of work such as Sunbeam, Virginia, Motors, Manhattan? Do you have any more information about those? Um, for my report, is that I'm supposed to identify and, the, and get the time of period they were there. Um, my reports run anywhere from, I think I'm up to 100 and some pages on the different people so far that I have um, written about. I have not gone into um exactly what their job but it won't be from a research point of view it won't be difficult to find that information okay great and we have a great question from amy birch and do you plan to look into this area again next year when the full 1950 census is made public provided that that's what alexandra <laughs> wants me to do um, um this is not my only project and i'm i'm i have about nine projects under my belt right now and so, you want to produce women, I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and then also, do you have uh, an idea of the number of family members in each unit where um, where you located residents? Um, well, what happened is that some of them had children. I was able to identify them, you know, with children. But when you if you use the city directory until they become adults, you won't know who's in that household if you're just using the city directory. The census would have helped. And that's something I could go back and look at when the 1950 census come out. Some of them are already gone by 1950. So what happened is that the census allow you to see who is in the household, where the city directory doesn't. The city directory uh, will mention the, um, the, the head of the household, which is usually the male, and in parenthesis will have his wife. If his wife is working, we give you a little bit more information. She'll be listed with the husband, and also she'll be listed as a single individual because she's working and they'll and would tell what her occupation is many of the women were working they, they had jobs they didn't they were not housewives um i think with uh tibby his wife was a housewife um but she also taught well she was home but she taught music so she actually um taught piano 
to um, students. So she took in students to, you know, and uh, taught them how to play the piano. And Shama, could you speak to what you brought up earlier in your presentation about uh, the current sense of social stigma for living there? Um, so was that at the time or did it change over time? Could you speak to that? It's usually the children of the, of, of the, of the individuals who live there. Okay. Uh, okay, so, um, and so they are the hardest ones to, 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 um, to um, be able to get them on board. Now, Freddie, I don't know, uh, Freddie um, Daniels, who's living in North Carolina, I have not, he lived there as a child, and then he lived there as an adult when he got married, and so did his brother. Um, so I haven't been able to crack that yet, but I'm working on it. Okay, great. And I have a couple of questions that have actually come in by email and, and text, and I do want to remind our participants, you can still put questions into the chat. But uh, one of the questions is, how long did it take you to identify these 35 families? How long? Uh, when I first took on a job, I didn't, de I devoted uh, maybe about 10 hours a week. And then, um, then I had to devote more time because I had to go to a research institution to be able to get to, to do what I did. And then I had to verify everything. So what I did, I once I located the name then i had to go through the city directory to make sure you know they there they there what year whether they move in because i had no idea what year they were living there and so i had to do that so i want to say that if i was to work on it every day it would probably have taken me probably about maybe um monday through friday it would probably t would take me probably a good month or month and a half and another uh, question, um, was there any research done on families occupying the homes after 1955? After 1955? Yes. After 19, any research done on the families after 1955? No, I mean, because my, my whole, the, the um, I was, my, my contract stated that to identify who was living at the Ramsey homes, I, right now, I have people up to the 50s, and I still got another 10 more years to work on, which is for 19, um, for um, 19, what is it, nine, for, this is from 1942 to 1955, I have up to 1965 to do. Okay, so you're still continuing with the project? And yes, I'm still on the project. This is just the first half of what I've found so far. And, and then if someone, um, oh, and then uh, uh, in addition to that question, are you taking any leads? Are you interested in receiving leads with people know anything about families after 55? Are you accepting that information? And well, up to 1965. Uh -huh. um, okay. Yeah, so they were there between 1942 to 1965. That's what um, I was hired to do. If they want to talk to me about anybody after 1965, um, then I will listen. <laughs> so. Great, thank you. And then one of the other questions that I had that was um, not in the chat, for someone starting out, what is the best method one can use to locate individuals who once lived in a community? Well, depending on your research skills, you have to have your research skills, you have to have that before you even start. And um, the process, the thing about it is that because most people depend on looking at things on it, using the internet all the time or whatever, they overlook that you have to make sure your skills are solid in place because it's not just one document. Um, if, if I didn't have the research skills in place when the COVID-19 happened, I wouldn't know what to do. You know, I would say, oh my God, what I'm gonna do because I've been doing this for 40 years, this month will be 40 years that I've been actually doing genealogical research. I knew how, knew what else I can go to. If this closed down, I know what, where to go. So for one thing, you, you, you have to have solid skills to be able to do the research. Then once you started doing the research um, and um, you have to connect whatever, whatever um, community that you're researching, you have to connect to the people who live in that community. So most of the people that lived in the Ramsey homes, some of them, were born in, in Alexandria, but a lot of them came from other places like Arkansas. You got um, the one that um, I just, the last one I talked about was um, 
what's his name? Uh, the one that I found, um, I can't remember. Well, anyway, his family were in Kentucky. I didn't have to leave my house. I didn't have to fly on a plane, but I found them. <laughs> they were in Kentucky. And that's where um, his son and all of them are living in Kentucky. Um, so you have to be able to know how to go about doing those things. And um, it takes time to learn those skills. I spent the first 10 years in genealogy learning everything I could learn, everything, every workshop, every conference, genealogical conference, books that I could read, everything. Um, I have my own personal library here at home. I have all of Wesley Peppinger's uh, works that he wrote about Alexandra. I have my, you know, it's just that if this is what you want to do, you're going to have to spend the time and the money to be able to learn it, to be able to um, build up your library. You're going to have to have the personality to deal with the different ethnic groups that you might want to research. You got to know the uh, cultural norms. You have to know not uh, the culture, and you have to know the cultural taboos, because you make one mistake with a uh, uh, with a, uh, 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 a group of people, you are locked out of that forever. <laughs> They're not going to talk to you. So you got to be careful in how you uh, present yourself. Um, and, you know, be able to do that. And Shar, do you want to share about some of the other projects you're working on that focus on Alexandria? I know there have been so many and there's so many that you have in, in the hopper <laughs> that are coming up, but I know some you can't, you may not be able mm -hmm. to talk about, but yeah. what can you share with us? Um, I'm working at uh, working on a project with the Virginia Theological Seminary looking for individuals who worked at um, uh, theological, um, at the Virginia Theological Seminary. At the, when they built that institution, it was considered Fairfax County. Um, during, during, um, now is part of Alexandria as of, I think, the 1920s. So it's an Alexandria project. Um, and so I'm looking for people who worked there between 1860, I'm looking for their descendants really, from 1865 to 1950. So that's one project. My other project um, that I'm working on, one of, one of them I can't talk about yet because I haven't signed a contract. So as soon as I sign a contract, I can talk about it. <laughs> but uh, one of the other projects is working with the All Saints Souls Church Sharon Chapel that's in uh, off of Franconia and that is part of Fairfax County. And the other project I'm working on, they are outside of um, Alexandra. And Char, this is a, actually a personal question um, mm -hmm. for me with the, the descendants that you were able to talk to for this project, did they give you any sense of their sense of community? living in the Ramsey homes uh, during that time? Did they know their neighbors? Did they, was there much interaction? Uh, were you able to learn anything about that? With the Cross family, um, they, are, um, they are still in the Alexandria area. Um, Miss B. Uh, Cross Taylor lives over there across the street from Bethel Cemetery as her uncle. They used to live in uh, what is called, what was called um, Black, uh, colored Rosemont. That's mm -hmm. where they live at three uh, in on Whiff Street in that area. So basically, they just went across the street to the Ramsey homes. Um, uh, what um, the Cross family, um, B's grand, um, let's see, B's father, B's grandfather, Cross. He came up from North Carolina to Alexandria, but um, Richard, her um, uncle, they all lived in that in a house they owned on Whiff Street in Cullick, uh, Rosemont. And then when he went into the military, um, he was able to get his own place at Ramsey. And Char, do you know if uh, one of our uh, questions that's coming in the chat, do you know if any of the, the pet, uh, from the dependents, if their parents went to dances at the Elks Lodge at 215 North Patrick Street? Mm, I don't know. I've never asked them that, but I could, you know, very well. Um, the ones that especially are, here in Alexandria, look like the military ones who were not from Alexandria. Basically, they went across the street to um, to that to that club they had for military, and they kind of stayed to themselves. And some of them were working in Fort Belvoir, and some of them were working at the Navy Yard. And um, 
like the Tivies, they had their car, they had a car. I didn't ask the others whether they or family had a car, but the Tivies had a car. And sure, uh, uh, as the one of the as the last question as we're wrapping up, as as someone who grew up in Alexandria, you know the community, you know the people. You've done so much research in genealogy, not only with this project but with BPS and also with Friedman Cemetery. Uh, what do you take away from all these projects? What do they mean to you? Well, it's interesting. I um, did not know anything about the history of Alexandria growing up. Uh, my parents also migrated to Alexandria. They came from Halifax County, Virginia. And um, I knew Halifax, for, you know, because I did research in Halifax. I knew it with my eyes closed. But it, I realized I was born in Alexandria and did not know the richness of the African-American history. But um, it was in the, I think I was 31 years old when I took a Black history tour with Mr. Um, Anderson. And he told me, told us for the told us about the uh, Freedom House, which is the slave pen. I had no idea. I grew up, I went to Charles Houston, I went to Parker Gray, I went to T.C. Williams. I never knew anything about that slave pen. And I'm there hollering on the street, why didn't y'all tell me? And he said that when he grew up, he did not know about it. And I promised myself they won't happen again. And I went all out to learn as much as I could and um, about the history of, of, of uh, African-Americans in Alexandria. And I've been enjoying the ride. I've been enriched by their struggles. I've been in tears about their pain. And I really have, uh, um, you know, have dedicated uh, my time to find out more and to talk to the older people because and when I was growing up, you couldn't ask questions. That's how it was. But now older people are willing to talk. So people need to talk to them to get, you know, because they know quite a bit. And I have uh, friends among many. And so anything I want to know is interested in Alexandria. If you lived on Okonoko Street, you don't go ask somebody what happened on um, that's um, that's down there um, in Delray. They'll tell you, I didn't grow up down there. <laughs> so people were territorial. They knew the people that, that were in their area, their little their neighborhood. So when I'm looking for somebody, I definitely have to go to my people and tell them this person, I go to the people who grew up in that, who, who grew up in that neighborhood. Otherwise, they're not going to be able to tell you what you need to know. They really stayed within their neighborhoods, though they went to school, they all went to segregated schools. But when it came to their day to day lives, it was in the neighborhood they grew up and those are the people they felt comfortable with. Great. And Char, um, just before we close out, uh, you've just gotten wonderful comments about your research and people saying how much they enjoy and respect your research. Uh, Anna Moss was just sharing that she's from Halifax County uh, to oh. uh, Rothrock would love for you to take a look at the, uh, the minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. for the Elks Lodge that uh, go back to 1904. Okay. So there's lots of response in the chat. Uh, it's mm -hmm. been wonderful having you for this session. We know that you're going to keep continuing the good work and keep fighting the good fight for us here in Alexandria and documenting mm -hmm. this really important history. And it's been a pleasure to know you as a friend for close to 20 years. And it's mm -hmm. so wonderful to know that you know, you've been so generous to this community with sharing your information and the respect that you give to all of the people that you work with is tremendous. So again, I thank you. Uh, we will definitely be hearing more from you and definitely inviting you back. And many thanks again for this wonderful presentation. Good afternoon and welcome to the Ramsey Holmes Symposium's third and final session, the Prefab 4, Experimental Design and Construction of the Ramsey Homes and New Digital Technologies for Interpretation. My name is Susan Hellman. Bill Conkey and I will be your hosts for this session. Uh, and we are thrilled to introduce three amazing speakers. It's gonna be really, really great. Um, before we move on though to the presentation, some housekeeping of course, with any sort of um, Zoom hearing. Um, AIA continuing credits are available uh, for this session, for today's symposium. Uh, so if you wanna receive credit, please enter your name, email address and AIA number in the chat function in the screen at the beginning of the session and we'll forward that information along to AIA. So if you have any questions during the talk, please again, use the chat function, you know, not the raise your hand thing, but the chat function and 
If it's something that Bill or I can answer, we will do that during this talk, but otherwise we'll wait till the end of the session and the speakers will address what your questions are. So we will have a discussion section at the end after the three have finished um, speaking. And if you need to step away for a moment or something like that, don't worry because the session's being recorded and it will be available through Historic Alexandria's YouTube channel, Historic ALXVA after the, after the event. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Al Cox, who was my boss. Um, he is, uh, has been a practicing architect since 1977, and he became a partner of the award-winning firm in Dallas, Texas. He was executive director of the Dallas Historic Preservation League in 1989 and a member of the Dallas Landmark Commission. Al joined the BAR staff in 1991 and became Alexandria's first city architect. His responsibilities have included technical preservation assistance to various departments for city-owned historic buildings, as well as design review of private development and public enhancement projects throughout the city. From 2000 to 2010, he managed the city's East Eisenhower Field Office for code enforcement during the construction of over 12 million square feet of private development. Al returned to the planning department in 2010 to become historic preservation manager and he guided the BAR staff during the streamlining of the Parker Gray District's design guidelines and the consolidation of the two, bar, two BARs into a single board. In 2003, Al received the AIA Virginia Award for Preservation. He was elected to the AIA College of Fellows in 2005 and served as president of AIA Northern Virginia in 2009. Sadly, he retired from the city in 2000 and we miss him. So on to you, Al, go for it. Thank you very much, Susan. I hope you were all able to watch the terrific presentations this morning about the history of public housing, this project and the people who live there. Um, as I have been assigned the coveted after lunch time slot, I'm certainly not offended if you find yourself napping for the next 30 minutes, but please don't um, miss John and Susan who will follow me um, as part of this same presentation. I believe that William Ramsey's house, now the Alexandria Visitor Center, and not to be confused with the Ramsey Homes, as Charba um, and uh, Anna explained, is the first prefabricated house in Alexandria. While the urban myth promoted in the 1950s by Rebecca Ramsey Reese and repeated on the current National Park Service website, has long held that the house was, quote, probably barged up from Dumfries, Virginia, to its present site in 1749, unquote. I don't believe there's any way this two-story house was barged 27 miles up the Potomac River through the shallow marsh at the foot of King Street and drug up the Sandy Bluff to its present site. However, based on many advertisements for timber frames in the Maryland Gazette at that time, um, it is reasonable to believe that the timber frame of the dwelling, of the dwelling was prefabricated by master carpenters in Dumfries, numbered, disassembled, and brought to Alexandria. Alexandria to reassemble and clad with shingles and siding. Many other early houses in Alexandria were prefabricated in a similar manner so that they could be constructed on the purchased lot within the two year time frame imposed by the town trustees. So we have a long history of prefabricated dwellings in Alexandria. There were certainly other prefabricated structures erected in Alexandria over the years around the time that the Ramsey homes were being constructed but none of these were concrete. The Delray Sears house that you see here, um, the materials were able to be delivered by train to the adjacent Potomac Yard quite easily. The little taverns a little bit later in the century were assembled from porcelain metal wall and roofing panels. And this example on North Washington Street could be disassembled and relocated in the future if necessary. The Reliance home on Duke Street was made of corrugated aluminum wall panels, and these have almost all been replaced by what are affectionately known today as McMansions. I think that's become an official um, architectural history technical term at this point. There were also at least one Lestron house in Alexandria, which was made of those same porcelain enamel panels as a little tavern, but I couldn't find a photo of the dwelling for this presentation. 
there was another precast concrete experimental wartime housing project that was being constructed in the Cameron Valley of Alexandria at the same time. But as John will explain later, it was made of Vitacrete, a different patented system that was not used at the Ramsey homes. You will note that these projects were published in the Architectural Record Magazine in March 1942 as progressive experimental prototype housing that could provide solutions to the national need for affordable housing at that time. Poured in place concrete houses were briefly in, uh, explored as durable fireproof construction, this one by Thomas Edison, but they never received public acceptance. Poured in place concrete is labor intensive and re would require specialized formwork. It would also have required a very strong crew to move um, Edison's proposed concrete furniture, refrigerators and pianos. The next two slides, um, and you've seen one of these already, show the extremely poor physical condition of the uptown neighborhood in the 1940s and 50s. There was clearly a need for modern, safe, sanitary, low-cost housing. Please keep these images in mind when we view the very modern designs proposed for the Ramsey homes. Oops, sorry. So the architect selected for this project was Smith, Werner and Billings with Delo Smith as the project architect. Smith was a noted architectural historian an inaugural member of the Alexandria BAR in 1946 and was a member of the Alexandria Housing Board and widely respected for his ecclesiastical and civic projects in a neoclassical or colonial revival style. Markedly different from what he was about to propose for the Ramsey Homes projects. As you can see in this image from the July 1941 construction documents, one of the initial designs proposed uh, quadplex units A and C at the ends of the site, flanking a two-story linear multifamily uh, building B that had a very horizontal emphasis with a flat roof and almost a motel architectural typology. Uh, you can see that elevation here with the guardrails for a little balcony on the upper floor, very similar to what you might have seen on roadsides um, throughout the country in that period. The quadplex end units also had a flat roof with a cantilevered cornice and horizontal wood siding on wood framing. So the early ones were wood framing. Um, there were party walls constructed of concrete masonry units or concrete block as they're more widely known that separated the four two-story dwelling units and these walls project as fins beyond the face of the building that you can see here on either side. <clears throat> the double hung windows had no muttons and were set in the wall as single or paired units. There is a um, skylight at the center of the building that you see here and a detail here that also served as a thermal chimney or ventilation shaft to help cool all four of the two-story dwelling units. You can see a clear stylistic relationship to the horizontal wood siding and the flat roof of the Usonian house that Frank Lloyd Wright designed in Falls Church in 1941. So there, sorry, there was a lot going on here in the 1940s right before the war. And then of course there was a building boom in Alexandria after the war. Um, but these images were being widely shared in the architectural magazines at the time. The long horizontal building B was eliminated in the final design and the three quadplexes and a single triplex were constructed instead. The bottom of this image is a title block of the construction drawings. As the mayor noted this morning, this defense housing project was managed by the Federal Works Agency and the U.S. Housing Authority under the Lanham Act. This highlights the individual dwelling uh, unit locations and the play area uh, shown here in green behind the triplex. The red square in this drawing indicates the unit that was exposed for us by ARHA in order to study the Fabcrete structural system prior to the building's demolition. And we did a tour of that as an early uh, step in the mitigation of the Section 106 housing. So this shows the first and second floor plans of the quadplexes, and I've got a yellow line here showing the party wall that separates those units. 
The two-story unit plans are bilaterally symmetrical and are quite efficient. The kitchen and living room on the ground floor here, and here's the kitchen with a patio that's right outside the front door uh, for outdoor dining. Uh, there's a single bathroom at the top of the stairs serving the two bedrooms that are here and here. So this is the bathroom and this is that ventilation shaft that will ventilate all four of the units as the hot air comes in from down below up the stairs and out the top. The final elevation drawing in October 1941 shows little change to form and floor plans, but fabcrete, as you can just barely read here, is now specified for the exterior walls. And John will explain the system in more detail in the next presentation. As I mentioned earlier, Delo Smith was known for his traditional architecture, but the Ramsey homes are quite avant-garde in both material and design. So what is modernism? Where did it come from? And where else was it being used? In general, modernism originated in post-World War I Europe, first with art, graphic design, and furniture that rejected a historic precedent, precedent and the old order. Mondrian here in 1929 is already exploring his red, blue, and yellow squares with the, in the black lines. And Jarrett Rittveld is producing furniture in this very simple but very colorful um, style. And then Rittfeld went on to do in 1924, the Schroeder house in Utrecht, Holland, uh, that shows that same flat roofed cube kind of volume with punched windows. Um, and in this case, some of the corner windows, but similar um, compositional elements to the Ramsey house. The Bauhaus in Germany became the most famous for training artists and architects in this clean utilitarian style that was devoid of ornament and led ultimately to the international style as it was known. It was directed by Walter Gropius, who also designed the main school building here and later Mies van der Rohe. Mies is credited with the design maxim, less is more. So what are the elements of modern design? Well, you see that they were influenced by the Bauhaus and later the international style they had an underlying social purpose. So again, clean, sanitary housing. Uh, Europe was responding to a lot of demolition after World War I and then later World War II. Um, and so they were trying to rebuild after those wars. The use of green space and courtyards at grade was designed to encourage people to go outdoors um, for their health. They were not ornamented. Uh, they played with experimental, industrial, and durable materials. Structure always informed the design. This is that form follows function maxim. And they were generally rectilinear with flat roofs, punched windows, and a flat facade. Frank Lloyd Wright was widely admired by the European modernists and his Unity Temple design in Oak Park, Chicago was uh, widely published in the Euro European magazines. Here you see his design for falling water in Pennsylvania. It is one of the earliest uses of cast concrete for residential um, uses in the United States and enabled sections of the house to cantilever here out over the run. Gropius and Van der Rohe uh, both immigrated to America just before World War II and became instructors at the Illinois Institute of Technology and the Harvard Graduate School of Design profoundly influencing generations of future architects. The leading local practitioner of modernism was Charles Goodman. He designed the original terminal building at National Airport in 1941, there's that date again, and constructed a glass pavilion addition to his own Victorian farmhouse on Quaker Lane in 1954, but is best known locally for the Holland Hills development just south of Alexandria City in Fairfax County, where there are dozens and dozens of these very simple flat roofed uh, planar houses with large plate glass. These are significant local projects that were widely published in the architectural press at the time. There were a few residential modernist buildings constructed within Alexandria during the mid 20th century, such as the striking building here at 2800 Farm Road. Many Alexandria variations of modernism, however, were originally classic Alexandria red brick 
rather than the limestone or white stucco of the international style. The example in the upper right of the, in the 1300 block of Princess in Parker Gray is a unified composition of four townhomes. More common, however, in Alexandria and in many parts of the country are the commercial buildings that are generally um, not appreciated as much by the public. The one shown here, for instance, at 600 North Henry was demolished several years ago to make way for public open space over behind the post office on Wyth Street. The original modernist design of the Ramsey homes was not embraced by the public. And when the original flat roof began to leak by the 1960s, Arha added a pyramidal hipped roof and shed roofs over the entrances here um, and nailed aluminum shutters, of course, to the wall flanking the uh, vinyl replacement windows, creating a somewhat dumpy looking version of the classic American four square that you see here. Um, and you can see the four square buildings all over Delray and, and Rosemont. Um, so flat roofs didn't last long here for residential buildings. There are actually a couple of buildings over in um, Beverly Hills in Alexandria that were kind of a Pueblo Deco style with flat roofs and they've been hidden and covered up with hipped roofs and um, shutters, of course, hung on either side of the windows. So this is an image of the four Ramsey homes looking northeast from North Patrick Street. John and Pervy and I were unable to discover when the ochre colored synthetic stucco coat was applied over the Fabcrete panels. City staff worked with the BAR and ARHA to develop a plan that recognized ARHA's need to update the affordable housing units and to add market rate units to the site while preserving one of the quadplex units. You can see the quadplex unit that was proposed to be saved here at the north end of the site. This was the favored scheme that restored and interpreted one quadplex and located the new multifamily building at the south end of the site, as you see here in the red. The preserved quadplex would have added four units to the total number of dwellings in the project or could have been used to expand the adjacent Black History Museum. Unfortunately, that plan, sorry, Unfortunately, that plan was rejected at the final city council meeting in favor of demolition of all of the historic quadplexes, relocating the new building toward the north and creating an anonymous open space at the south end of the site. While no one opposed the open space in concept, Wyth Street is designated in the Braddock Master Plan as a ceremonial pedestrian street connecting the waterfront to the Braddock Metro Station because it passes by the Charles Houston Rec Center, the Black History Museum and Resource Center, the Historic Church of God and Saints, the little um, historic white church that's across the street on Route 1 there, and the U.S. Post Office. With will have wider brick sidewalks and ornamental street lights in the future to signify its urban civic importance. However, the BAR was able to shift the new building a few feet to the south to pick up some open space here and a small trellis um, to give some visual breathing room for pedestrians on Wyth Street. Um, and this is certainly my own personal opinion that it's unfortunate that the modern building at 600 North Henry um, and the Ramsey House both were sacrificed for a lawn. However, kudos to Arha and BAR and their architects at KTGY for designing a building that respects the scale, the rhythm, um, and the, the appropriateness on North Patrick Street to the maximum extent possible to fulfill their program. The push and pull of the red brick facade intentionally recalls the setbacks and open spaces of the red brick post-World War II garden apartments in Old Town and some details from the Art Deco building in the nearby Parker Gray, or nearby in Parker Gray. So to the end of this, why isn't precast concrete widely used for residential construction in the US today? John will explain the patented systems proposed and used at Ramsey Homes in a moment, but we have discussed and believe there are a number of reasons that it did not take off here. And we're certainly interested in hearing your comments um, later on at the end of the presentation. Precast is widely used for commercial construction in the US. And there have always been a number of small manufacturers promoting modular housing in the US. 
particularly after World War II, everyone from Buckminster Fuller, who promoted his Dymaxion house, to General Motors in Alcoa promoting prefab housing to take up the slack um, after the industrial production around World War II. But they never overcame the cost and flexibility of wood stud and or brick construction that can be erected by anyone local that has a pickup truck and a tool belt. Timber frame kits are still being produced today by several companies in New England and are even more viable with computerized production systems, but they still have to be shipped and assembled by semi-skilled craftsmen on site using a crane. Small companies also tend to go out of business over time, making it impossible to obtain proprietary new parts if a porcelain metal wall panel is damaged or for a subsequent owner to construct additions or alterations. And John and Pervy will discuss this more in their next presentation. So now I would like to turn this over to John and Thank let you, him Al. follow up. That was great. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about John before he gets going. Um, and while we switch screens and so forth, uh, John's a structural engineer and heritage building specialist with 20 years of professional engineering experience. He's got extensive experience in the structural assessment investigation and repair of existing structures, and he embraces working collaboratively to develop sound preservation strategies. And I can, I can uh, definitely agree with that because uh, when I used to run a very a museum, a very, very old building, John was enormously helpful in uh, keeping that thing standing up. Um, he holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Maritime Systems Engineering from Texas A&M, and a Master of Architecture and Master of Arts in Historic Preservation from the Savannah College of Art and Design. In September 2018, John joined the Department of State's Office of Cultural Heritage. His position oversees the proper stewardship of over 230 federally owned or operated culturally significant overseas properties. Prior to joining OBO, Mr. Dumsick's work focused on preservation engineering and the conservation of historic structures. Am I still on? Yes, Am I okay, Gretchen, to proceed? We can hear you, John. Go ahead, John. I'm sorry? to various organizations. From 2007 to 18, he served on the, on the Association for Preservation Technologies Board of Directors as a co-chair for the Preservation Engineering Technical Committee. And since 2018, he has served as a structural specialist for Fairfax County, Virginia's Task Force One, a domestic and international disaster response resource with expertise in the rescue of victims from collapsed structures. In 2019, John was selected as an expert member to the International Scientific Committee on the Analysis and Restoration of Structures of Architectural Heritage, ICOMOS basically. He was recognized as a preservation engineering professional by APT in 2019 and was received into APT's College of Fellows in 2020. So without further ado, here's John. Thank you, Susan. Uh, that was a very nice and warm welcome. I look forward to sharing a lot of information that not only the three of us learned, but many members of in the city of Alexandria's Office of Historic Alexandria, um, Office of, of Historic Alexandria, as well as many citizens. So the purpose and goals of our investigation was to research, observe, and document the as-built structural conditions of the Ramsey homes. We were also tasked with evaluating the constructability of the selected proprietary precast system and to review and evaluate the original goals from the patent based upon the building's historical performance. And lastly, to integrate all of this wonderful information of as-built conditions of the Ramsey homes into a digital BIM model. So I'd like to start off with a couple of definitions so what is prefab? I want you to think back when you were five years old and you had your erector set or you had your Lincoln logs or your Tinker toys or your Legos. 
Those are all prefabricated parts. This is largely based upon Block and Whitney's interchangeable parts for the firearm industry. These are mass produced components of an assembly. They are made to high level of specifications to ensure those components can be joined and implemented into an assembly. They also allow for the installed components to be repaired and or replaced. So for our non-building people, I'm going to explain concrete very briefly. Concrete was developed by the Romans or some say maybe even for the pyramids, maybe even early, earlier than the Romans. But it is a cementitious product mixture of, in modern times, Portland cement, which is a hydraulic cement, large aggregates, stone, and small aggregates, sand, and water. When you mix these components together, a hydration process occurs and it cures the concrete, it solidifies the concrete mix. Admixtures now are commonly added to modify the workability, the durability of the concrete, the amount of water, and the time to cure. Currently, recycled content is integrated into modern mixes to offset the quantity of cement required and to improve the chemical and mechanical properties of the concrete. These include slag, fly ash, etc. It is widely known that concrete is strong in compression, but is naturally weak in tension. So, we must add steel or other, in this, you know, carbon fiber reinforcement is a new version, but typically we add steel to increase the strength. Uh, as you can see in the pictures on the right, concrete requires wood or aluminum forms to mold its shape. The pictures on the right also show some unique things to consider when using cast in place concrete. This is a driveway that my father and I built. You can see that the steel reinforcement is placed, but there's a lot of water around. You see, we have to install pumps to get the water out and maintain that soil in a stable condition so we can pour the concrete. Also, you need to be considerate of details, devils in the details, especially with concrete. So you need to think about expansion and contraction, shrinkage, and creation of specific types of joints to address those conditions. So what is precast concrete? So we came from prefabricated to concrete. So what is precast concrete? It was invented in 1905 by John Alexander Brody. He was the city engineer for, this, for Liverpool in England. And he developed a precast system to be used for the Liverpool tram stable buildings in 1906. In this process, concrete is cast into parts using re reusable molds in a controlled, usually off-site environment. The layout, the concrete mix, and the curing is closely monitored for increased quality and durability. Typically, it is delivered to the site and lifted in place, or tilt up, which is another term that is along the lines with precast concrete. It initially has a cost that is relatively high for mold production, but usually the return on cost increases with the amount of quantity. After World War II, this was an established and a significant industry for the construction of buildings and infrastructure. So let's look at the specific patent used at the Ramsey homes. Patent 2270846 belongs to Joseph Hines. He was of Fabcrete Construction Company in Richmond, Virginia. It's very helpful to review the patent to understand the intent of the design. So on the right is a list of those properties that he was exploring. He wanted to create a building using units that can be constructed easily and quickly assembled. He also wanted a system that was a complete structural system that was held together in a rigid configuration to provide not only the walls and the partitions, but the floors and roofs. 
He also wanted it to be lightweight. He wanted it to be implemented with manual labor. He wanted it to be water and fireproof. He also wanted his system to be flexible, to be able to produce any desired shape and size of a building and at a minimal cost. He wanted to eliminate the use of interior framework, which is typical for cast in place construction. And he wanted to allow his system to readily accommodate interior building finishes. Here is his patent with all the bits and bops of part of his, a part of his system. As you can tell, his system is constructed of L-shaped panels. These panels integrate a stiffening element that is used for both the wall and the roof and floor systems. He joins these together in a tongue and groove fashion and then draws them tight with tension elements shown here in blue. What is also unique about this system is that he identified the need of unique panels around window and door openings. These include spandrels and lintels, as well as U-shaped channels on each side of the window jam. Lastly, to allow for architectural finishes to be fastened to these precast concrete elements, a wooden element was embedded into the system. That is shown at the bottom with figure eight. So what available documentation did we have at our fingertips? Well, we had various concepts and revisions of the Ramsey homes from April to October, 1941. Other housing in Alexandria, as Al said, experimented with other types of masonry systems, including rammed earth and stabilized earth units. These were actually installed in Cameron Valley. Cast in place reinforced concrete was explored for building B only. Building B was the long hotel like structure at the center of the site that Al commented previously. Building A and C, which were the quadruplexes, explored first conventional construction techniques of wood framed floors and roofs, exterior walls, interior party walls or firewalls were developed or detailed as precast concrete masonry units. Later, in July of 1941, the first of two proprietary precast concrete systems were introduced. The Vitacrete system was comprised of thin rectangular slabs. These slabs were typically shown to be two inches in thickness by about 24 to 30 inches in width. The floors relied on steel joists for intermediate support. This system appears to have been installed in Cameron Valley and documented with the architectural record article. Fabcrete proposed a complete structural system of thicker panels, but not as wide. And this was selected for Ramsey. One note about the available documentation that could help in the future or on your project is obtaining construction documentation, such as Fabcrete shop drawings, as built contractor submittals, field reports, construction photographs, and or some form of summary for this pilot project. So let's dive into the base design. This is part of the original design documents for buildings A and C. Here you see conventional two by 10 floor joists spanning 12 feet and supported by an interior partition. The exterior walls here are detailed to be wood construction while the fire, the firewall between the four units is of concrete masonry. The Vitacrete option employed continuous planks that were intermediately supported by steel beams at approximately three foot on center. 
Here is a detail demonstrating the continuity of the precast planks and their supports by railroad beams. Vitacrete also presented exterior wall panels. I want you to note how wide these panels are and we're gonna compare them with the Fabcrete option later. Here's a photograph from the architectural record showing what appears to be Vitacrete. You can tell that we have steel beams supporting these relatively thin planks intermediately. Now, Fabcrete, as shown here, is spanning very much like the conventional wood floor framing. These panels, up to eight inch in depth, are spanning 12 feet. Here are some details from the architectural record. I'm showing these because the copy from the original design documents is not as clear. But what I would like to show you is that all of these bits and bops were successfully erected for both the exterior walls and the floor and roof. Here is a view of the exterior walls. And I want you to see the relative narrowness of these Fabcrete panels in comparison with the Vitacrete option. So how do we document the as-built conditions? Our first, our first research was reviewing the architectural record draw, uh, document from March of 1942. This was actually during the construction of the Ramsey homes. It is one reason why there may not be photographs of the Ramsey homes in that article. The other methods that we can document the as-built conditions is to make small openings called probes to expose the existing structure. These were done on one corner of one building of one unit. Additionally, we participated in field observation during the, demo, during the demolition. We were able to salvage several sample components which have been stored at the City of Alexandria Archives for future documentation. Pervy is going to comment on the ability to use the HABS documents and the photogrammetry into the BIM modeling effort. So here is an example of the probe at the first floor level. You can see that the panels of the second floor align directly with the studs of the exterior walls. You can see the tie rods, which are joined at the corner, as well as a steel angle that is integrated between the second floor plank and the first floor panels to allow for proper bearing of the second floor studs above. These probes also allowed us to explore the unique panels that are documented in the patent at the two sides of the windows and the lintel and the spandrel above and below, respectively. It allowed us to make field notes and measurements and come up with sketches of those unique panels for their integration into the BIM model at a later date. At the second floor, we continued a similar probe. What is unique here is that this, the roof panels do not align with the second floor studs. As a result, new support techniques had to be integrated. These include these bent plate angles that were bolted into the side of the flange of the stud panel. Additionally, with the removal of the concrete eave in the 1970s, we observed wood blocking to support the edge condition of the roof above. Hand sketches were performed to allow for 
documentation of these anomalies and for integration into BIM. Additionally, sketches were made in our, dis in inter our, our internal discussions to identify layout techniques of panels. Since we weren't able to remove all the finishes throughout the building, we adapted what we learned with the small probe to identify where unique panels had to be integrated. So during demolition, we were able to obtain actual physical elements for record and to observe the foundation systems after demolition. We saved a number of pieces, including the conventional L-shaped wall panels, as well as unique elements shown here on the right, this U-shaped system, which could be a, uh, a, window, a window unit. So lastly, let's review the original patent goals based upon what we learned from our probe and documentation investigation. It was easy and quick to assemble. Well, we know from records that the construction contract was awarded in November 22, 1941, and it took approximately nine months for substantial completion. We determined that the structure is its own complete structure system, and it's held rigidly with the use of the tie rods. We do not believe the patent met the criteria for being lightweight. If you, if you weigh or you calculate the weight of each panel for the conventional eight foot wall panel, it would weigh about 880 pounds. That is eight foot tall by 16 inches wide. Not very easily moved by one or two people. A 12 foot floor panel would even be uh, of higher weight, 375 pounds. Again, I would not want to be the person trying to install that from below. Was it durable? Well, per our observations, the structural system had limited deterioration for almost 80 years. Minimal water infiltration and, and uh, damage due to um, corrosion of embedded steel uh, was not observed. Flexibility of the layout. Because the uh, proprietary system was used on units that had a routine uh, floor plan, this could not be justifiably reviewed. Minimal cost. Okay, this structure for the construction cost cost $80,000. If we look at inflation alone, that $80,000 equates to $1.3 million today. It seems low to me, but this is the documentation that I could find. The total square feet is about 11,000. So the cost per square foot of the original construction was $7 a square foot. In modern times, that would be the equivalent of $115 a square foot. Given today's construction costs for residential construction in the 200 to $300 range, it would appear that the cost would be uh, a, um, a goal met by the, by the patent. However, this does not include any of the soft costs, site development fees, stuff of that nature. It eliminated interior formwork. And it permitted the integration of various finishes throughout the life of the structure, including plaster, and then gypsum board. The original wood nailers remained. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you, John. Great to hear from you. Um, we do have a couple of questions and we'll, we will hold those to the very end after Ms. Irwin is done. So I would like to, I am again thrilled to introduce our next speaker, uh, Pervy Irwin, as the practice manager for architecture at CAD Microsystems.
Kirby supports professionals across all disciplines with BIM technologies, which includes teaching Revit, creating content, developing workflows and standards, troubleshooting issues, and finding creative solutions to both design and modeling problems. She has over 17 years of experience, most spent as a preservation project architect, where she specialized in using innovative technologies to facilitate the documentation and rehabilitation of institutional buildings, and over 12 years of Revit experience working with historic buildings from conceptual design through construction administration and project closeout. Kirby's a re registered architect, or, uh, I can speak, architect with degrees in both architecture and historic preservation. She served on the Parker Gray Board of Architectural Review from 2012 until its consolidation with the Old and Historic District EAR in 2019. She was both board member and a board chair. She currently serves on the Alexandria Board of Architectural Review. In the past, Pervy was also active with both the local and national chapters of the Association for Preservation Technology. She's presented at many conferences over the years, including Biltna, Autodesk University, Design DC, AIA National Conferences, ArcX Conference, the APT Annual Conference, and local AIA chapter events. You can, you can find Pervy on Twitter a, at, at B-I-M-C-H-I-Q and on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Pervy Irwin. Again, here's Pervy to present her portion of the, uh, of the show, <laughs> of the presentation, and here she goes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. As you can see, I decided I wanted to be at the Ramsey Homes. So that is my background. It's much more interesting than what's actually behind me. Um, so thank you again. Uh, thank you to Al and John to all, and all the speakers today. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, everything that's been presented today. And I'm really excited to kind of be the last um, presenter before we get to the, the tour of the new building. Um, and so one, one thing I wanted to say before I started is, is I'm not sure if this was clear is that this whole symposium was put together as a mitigation technique uh, for the demolition of the structures. And so uh, I've been having some conversations with other preservationists online about mitigation techniques. And so this was one that we decided on and I'm hoping that we can get some good uh, dialogue if there are any preservationists in the audience about you know if they liked this uh, as, a, as a solution or not. Um, going forward. So this whole project was really a labor of love for me. Uh, I was a member of the Parker Gray Board of Architecture Review when this case came before us. And I live just a few sites, a few blocks from here. So I know it very well. Uh, you know, I've lived in Alexandria since 2005. And so it really is something that's near and dear to me. So I had a lot of fun and, and spent a lot more time than I probably should have building this Revit model. So before we jump into the Revit model itself, um, I want to give you a good overview of BIM because I know that we have a very uh, wide audience here on uh, at this symposium. I know that there's people from a lot of different professions and backgrounds, and I'm sure that the architects in the audience know what BIM is, but some of the rest of you might not. So BIM stands for Building Information Modeling. Uh, BIM is not actually a thing, it's a process. So when you think about a software that you use to make BIM, it's called a BIM aiding software. So it's, it's, a, it's a common kind of misconception that BIM is an object, it's actually a process. And it's what that process is, is the creation of this model that uh, can then be used for managing information, for coordinating construction, for simulation, uh, and then also can be used during facilities management. Um, it's currently used mainly for the design and documenting of projects during construction, and design and construction, but it more and more is being utilized for these other types of things um, afterwards. And the greatest thing about it is it is very flexible as to what you want to do with it. So whatever purpose you want, you figure that out and you build your model to serve you that purpose. So there are a lot of different BIM aiding platforms out there. The one that I'm going to focus on is a product called Revit by um, Autodesk. Many of you have probably heard of Autodesk. They are most commonly known for AutoCAD. Uh, AutoCAD and Revit are two of their most popular uh, products. But there are a few other companies that also make BIM aiding software. Uh, there are also um, other products for other industries, manufacturing, site work, things like that that are also BIM aiding software. 
So how can we use BIM for historic preservation? Well, because BIM is about information and it's a database, it's a great tool for historic preservation because it can hold information that's related to the physical elements and to the history of the site itself. This information really can be anything that you want and you can use the 3D representation of the model uh, to graphically show this information. Um, by allowing you to use kind of rule-based analysis inside of your model, you can get a better understanding of your site because the information, once it's put into the model, can be analyzed in a variety of ways. I'm gonna show you some of those. Um, but I wanna take one step back because there are lots of ways to kind of get the information that you that go into your um, model. And so I wanted to list here a few things that I've learned uh, over time. So back in 2014, I was lucky enough to be able to be part of a symposium that was given at the 2014 Association for Preservation Technology annual conference that was a documentation symposium. And it was all about different methods for evaluating and documenting uh, historic sites. And so there were a, a, there was a whole host of other sorts of resources out there on how to evaluate your buildings, both non-destructively and of course destructively with physical probes. Um, and so uh, I learned a lot here um, on top of just teaching others about the different technologies that you can use on the design side since that's where my background is. So you've already seen some of this information. John did run through the different materials that we had, so I don't need to rehash it again. Um, but I want to say that you know these did help us really to build the model because one thing about building a Revit model is that you're building a model, so you actually need to know how something is put together in order to build it. It's not like doing. I, I mean, when you do a 2D drawing, you're drawing lines that represent things, so sometimes you can fudge them a little bit. When you're doing a Revit model, you really have to know what it is to, in order to actually be able to build it in 3D. So of course we had this patent information. You already saw John's in-depth evaluation of it, so I don't need to go into any more detail. We had the historic drawings, which the biggest issue here, of course, is that these were not really the original as constructed drawings. They were a guide. Uh, for anybody who's worked on historic buildings, you know that uh, we document buildings during design way more thoroughly now than they ever did in the past. <laughs> and so you're not going to have that. I mean, it's it's very difficult to have that information because the tradespeople just kind of, they knew what they were doing. And if they came across a problem, they figured it out in the field and it wasn't necessarily documented anywhere. So that was one of our biggest problems was trying to use this historic documentation to figure out what was really there. Excuse me, Pervy, if you're showing slides, we're not seeing them. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. no. Yeah. Shoot. I mean, at first I thought you were doing it on purpose and then I thought, wait no, a minute. I was not doing it on purpose. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. No worries. I do. I am showing slides. <laughs> I went yes, this whole there time. There we go. Okay. All right. <laughs> sorry about that. So this is no my worries. first slide. Um, so BIM, I explained what BIM is. It's a process. Um, it's not a thing. I, I said most of the stuff that's on these slides. So. Uh, so these are the different platforms that are out there. Most of this is just words, so it's not too too much that you needed to see. Uh, talking, I, I explained this slide on the other evaluation methods. Okay, so here we go. So there's the patent information that John already explained very well. Uh, the historic drawings, which again were one, not super easy to read, and then two, um, not actually what was built. Uh, then now, okay, so here, here's where I was. So the architectural record was actually very useful. Uh, from our evaluation of the building, it turned out that this was kind of the closest to what was actually built with a few things that we kind of looked at and said, uh, we don't really think they would have done it that way. It doesn't make sense. And we, we made our own professional judgments on how it should be. Um, so the, the two sets of drawings that kind of really, uh, showed the as-built conditions were the 1995 renovation drawings. And here's one sheet from that set um, that was done by Sorg in 1995. Uh, so we got a good sense of the interior layout, right? So the, the biggest issue that we had with both the renovation drawings and then the Habs drawings is that while they were very good representations of the overall architecture and the overall space, they pretty much gave us no information about the actual structure, <laughs> which is what we were really interested in because that's the whole reason why these buildings are important and significant is because of the construction method that was used to build them. Um, so 
these these were really great again for the spatial layout and they helped us to kind of figure out where the general things were um, but not really any help with the structure there's another the habs elevations which you saw um anna saw these uh showed you these already so then one thing that was useful was the photography so we were able to take pictures uh, of the outside of all the buildings and then the inside of a couple of the buildings. Uh, we wanted to fly a drone so that we could take some overhead shots, but unfortunately being in the flight path of Reagan National Airport, we were not allowed. Um, the drones are connected to GPS and they physically will not get off the ground if they are in a no-fly zone. So we could not fly a drone, um, but we were able to use the photos to make some sort of 3D photo montage type models. Now these are not BIM, they're not smart, they're a 3D photo, but they did they do help us to understand uh, the building, especially those who were not able to walk around them themselves. And then of course, Google Street View was really helpful for me when I was building the surrounding site and kind of understanding the relationship um, of the various buildings surrounding the site. And I'll show you that in Revit in a little bit. Uh, so of course, here's some photos of the exterior. I don't think we've really shown any good close-up pictures of them yet today. So I wanted to allow you guys to have a chance to kind of see that. Uh, there was a little porch that had this interesting brick veneer on it, um, which was a little bit different than the rest of the construction. Uh, and then you can see the sort of the two opposing sides of the quads were the same, uh, which also posed uh, an issue with the photo montages, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, here's some more pictures of the interior. I know that Anna showed you a few, but here's a few more. So this is the first floor. We were able to do a probe. You can see in the top left picture where we did a probe in the corner to understand the wall and then the ceiling slash floor of the second floor. There's the little kitchen. You can see the stairs that go up uh, to the second floor. And then this is the upper floor. It was, you know, pretty much three spaces, two bedrooms and a bathroom, and then the little tiny hallway where the stair was. Uh, very hard to photograph. That was another issue. Now, one thing that you should notice in these photographs is you're going to see these little targets on the wall, these pieces of paper that were put on the wall. So Al took most of these pictures and he did that. Uh, he did those targets because when you do traditional photogrammetry, which is a way to take photos and then create drawings off of them, you have these targets that you use to then line up each individual photo with the other photos. So he did that in hopes that we could somehow do this, but it it wasn't really possible just because the space is so um, tight. All right, so how did we make this 3D montage? Well, here's a smattering of some of the photos that were used. I think I, I had, there were two different people that created these 3D photo montages uh, for, for me. Um, and I gave them both the same sets of photos and they used two different softwares. I'm gonna actually show you uh, examples of both. Um, but there were probably 40 or 50 pictures of each building. Uh, now, the biggest issue is that most of these softwares use artificial intelligence to kind of figure out what's the same in multiple pictures to be able to stitch them together. And so because these buildings are the same on these two sides and then the same on the other two sides, the, the computer gets confused. So it was a, a more difficult process uh, to be able to montage them. So the first one that I wanna show you, uh, this was um, a photo montage that was created by Dr. Benjamin Skolnick of Alexandria Archaeology, which you've heard him referenced already. Um, he's, he was super helpful to make uh, in making these. Um, and he used a specific software called Agisoft Metashape. Um, and then he was able to take them and host them on this online platform called Sketchfab. Uh, so these are just two screenshots taken from a little, like a, a very, light low resolution image that's online that you can actually spin around. So this is the triplex. Um, notice that you don't have the roof because we just didn't have pictures of it. And then inside of the porches, we also don't have uh, the actual information. You can kind of see holes. Um, the other thing is that these sort of softwares get really confused with vegetation because they just can't connect what's green here and green here. Like what's grass in one picture and grass in the other picture and how is it the same thing? So you'll notice all this weird kind of fuzzy greenness and you see it more here in the quad one where it's just kind of the grass. It doesn't know what to do with it. You, There are ways in the software to crop these things out and to clean them up a little bit, but I thought it was important to show you all 
that you know it's not a snap your fingers and it gets created sort of thing. Um, it does take uh, post processing to make sure that you get really what you want. Um, so these were both in that Agisoft MetaShape software, uh, but then this was one that was created by one of my colleagues, um, Matt Haraka, who is uh, the practice manager here for construction at CAD Micro, uh, and he used a software called Autodesk Recap, and it's a similar thing to what Ben used, um, just a different company software. But the reason I'm showing you this one is because I have access to this software, so I was able to make a little video to kind of spin you around the building. And uh, you can under, you can see you know where the holes were, <laughs> um, that there's no roof, that there's kind of a weird bush floating out in space, uh, and get a good understanding of you know what we had to work with and kind of what what the software can do. So hopefully that's interesting for you all to see kind of one way to document. And these little videos are nice because you can take them, you can put them up on websites and, you know, the general public can, can use them to, to learn about the sites. Um, okay, so how did we use the photos? So the photos were actually super useful for us to try to figure out how the panels were put together. You saw the sketches that John had done where he marked which were the C panels, which were the L panels. Um, and so here with this, with these photos that have this like, really uh, direct sunlight, you can actually see the shadows of where the panels went together. I marked them in red because I don't know what size screens you all have to be able to actually see those, but this really helped us to understand uh, where the different panels were. And you can definitely see that under and above the windows, there's kind of a double width panel. Uh, and then next to the windows, it's a narrower panel. And you can see that on the first and second floor, they don't necessarily line up. There was this offset. Uh, in the system to be able to support the second floor on the first floor walls. All right, so when we made our model, we had some modeling priorities. Again, the focus for the evaluation and for the BIM was the exterior and the structural system, and then the overall siting of the building in the neighborhood. Um, so because the, the structure was the significance of the building, that's why we focused on it. And then of course the interior was very simple. It was just two rooms on the first floor and three rooms on the, the second floor, and it didn't really change much over time. So. And it's very it's a very simple interior, so we didn't really take too much time trying to to model that. So the first thing I want to talk about is the site plan. So you see this drawing here. This is a a view from inside of Revit, and the red that you see around the site is the a civil survey of the site. So that's what I used to help figure out the actual site, where the sidewalks were, where the buildings were, where the fences were in relationship to each other. And then the, the sort of purple, green, yellow cyan that you see is actually the city of Alexandria's GIS department information of the whole city. So we have available to us as citizens of Alexandria, well, you can go online and get it, the entire city with all of the blocks. <laughs> so that is what I used to help model kind of the surrounding buildings to give it context. Um, so this is kind of, I, sh I put this in here because I wanted to show you like kind of the messiness of, of all the things I had to use to figure out what to model. And then this is that cleaned up version. So this is, you can see the four uh, Ramsey buildings and then you can see the blocks on the side. The block on the left is the Charles Houston Rec Center and then there's homes around it. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the Black History Museum is over here. So this is that plan view with shadows turned on. Um, next, so this is what I ended up creating. So this is the site plan uh, of Ramsey with just the surrounding block. Um, it takes a lot of time to build context. So this is kind of all I did just to get a general idea of, of it. Now, this is not 100% accurate. Again, I used you know a GIS map with some outlines on it, but I think it gives, and then I used Google Street View and just walking the site to understand the general height and massing of the surrounding buildings. Um, so another fun thing that we can do because we're using Revit is that we can actually make little walkthrough videos of the site. So from that model, I was able to make this little video that can take you through the site at eye level to have an understanding of how the buildings were sited uh, within their block and that green space that's around them and how they really are different from anything else that we have in Alexandria. 
Um, and you can make these little walkthroughs to go as fast or as slow as you want. There's all sorts of settings inside the software to be able to do that. Um, and to uh, show what you want. I mean, I have in here, I have shadows turned on. I do not have like the actual materials turned on. I didn't spend the time trying to make it look realistic, but I thought that this was a good uh, kind of compromise in between to show what it looks like, um, but not try to be too, too realistic with it. All right, so focusing on the individual buildings, on the left, we have a photo of a quad, and then on the right, we have actually the view from the Revit model of that same quad. Um, and then this was the model that I ended up creating. And actually at the end of my presentation, I'm gonna take you directly into Revit and we're gonna play around inside of it because it's a little bit easier to just move around and show you the different pieces and connect them to the things that John was talking about right before me. And then here's the same thing the triplex, uh, the photo, and the 3D. I unfortunately did not get the time to model the triplex with all of the panels, but it's very similar to the quad. All right, so next, this is a cutaway image of the quad that I built. Uh, you can see the kind of grayish color is the precast, and then the little brown pieces are all of the wood furring that was used in the building. Uh, on the right side of the picture, I have the floor, the floor panels modeled. On the left side, you can look through and kind of see the structure. The beauty here is I could make certain things partially transparent. So like the walls are partially transparent, so you can see through them and you can see what's behind it. And you can change how you see um, the different elements however you want. So you can make one view where you see certain things and a different view where you see other things. Uh, I'm going to show you that too. Um, and so this is where the real the real power of the BIM comes in, right? Because you can use it to analyze. So what I did here is I have the data. Each of those different types of panel is a different little block, almost like a Lego, right? So these are like Lego pieces and they're different kinds of Lego pieces. And then I put them together. Uh, and now they may use different heights of Lego pieces. I wasn't as concerned with like the height or the length of it. I was more concerned about the general geometry. So we had the two wall panels, we had a floor panel, we had a soffit panel, and then we had two that were in the windows. One that was at the spandrel or the sill and one that's at the, um, the head, right? And the beauty here is that I have all this information and then all I do is I make a schedule. So you see that schedule at the bottom of the screen, which is pulling the information that already exists in the model. So schedules in Revit are really great because they're real and they're live. So if you change something in your model, it updates your schedule automatically. If you add or remove elements, it, they get added or removed from the schedule. Now, because this isn't completely built, these numbers aren't 100% accurate to what was actually there, but they're showing in real time uh, which what panels there were, um, how many there were that are the, the first floor ones versus the second floor ones versus the different types. And so here's that same view that I showed you of the first floor cutaway with the whole floor colored to understand where the different panels are. All right, and then the last sort of piece I wanna talk about here is cutting sections through the model. So these two images on the left, the left and the middle are sections cut through the Revit model next to that architectural record drawing. And you can see, I tried to kind of match it up as best as I could. Um, I didn't model the windows, so you're missing like the window sills and the window heads and the actual um, sashes, but, um, and, and you can see that the details are a little bit different uh, based off of that, record, which was more of the patent information and the actual model, but you can cut these sections wherever you want. That's the beauty of Revit 2 is that you've modeled it. You can cut it wherever you want. And whenever you cut it, it just cuts right where you put that section. All right, so this has been super fun, but I want to take one step back and talk about some of the issues and some of the roadblocks that we had um, in hopes of helping you if you choose to do something like this for your projects in the future that you learn from the things that didn't work for, my, for us so that you don't have the same issues. So of course, if you can fly a drone, fly a drone. I mean, drones are pretty inexpensive these days and there, there's a lot of software out there that can take photos and build models. I actually just saw one a couple of weeks ago that a friend of mine posted on Twitter about one where you can take eight photos of your house and then it will like magically build a little model. Um, I haven't tried it yet, but I want to. <laughs> um, we were only able to photograph one interior. So we didn't, and if we, we weren't, since we weren't really trying to uh, 
to record the actual as builds of the interiors of each one, it wasn't as big of an issue. But you know, for full documentation, that would have been nice. Uh, we did the probes, but just in that corner, so it didn't allow us to investigate the different types of corner conditions that there are. Because as I started building the model, I started at that corner, and then I got to the next corner, and I was like, okay, now what happens here with these weird asymmetrical panels? And at first, we were like, well, maybe they flipped them, or maybe we did this. And then after John did the research, we came back and said, oh, well, these C-shaped panels are here. And then we looked at the photos, and we said, well, under and above the windows, it looks like it's a double wide panel. Oh, yeah, and it's actually this panel with a t-shaped support and we evolved it literally every single time john al and i met we like found we figured out new things <laughs> so um it it was it was definitely a fun learning experience um so and then i mentioned some of these other things the existing the existing drawings and their quality and the the reliability of the information um so how can you do this successfully um if you I would try as much as possible to laser scan. Laser scanning is uh, surprisingly accessible these days. I would say 10 years ago, it was a lot harder, but I actually consult for an eight person interior design firm that owns their own laser scanner and they scan every single project that they do because they, they always do projects, renovation projects in existing buildings. And they just find that that is the most efficient and cost-effective way for them to get their existing conditions. So if you can scan it, scan it. Um, at my old firm, we actually had a project where we scanned the building and then they went to do demo and they realized that there were pieces of it that were worse deteriorated than they thought and they actually had to replace them but they had already started demolishing it before they had the chance to measure anything but then they had the the, the laser scan so they didn't need to worry about measuring it and so it actually helped them to then put certain things back where they were because that laser scan existed so you'll always find uh uses for it that you didn't think of at the beginning um, of course, check your documentation, but survey. We all know that, those of us who work with existing buildings. Um, hand sketches, you know, you saw John's sketches. It really helps you understand how something's put together. Um, and then using Revit to build the model virtually really, really helped us to understand how we put it together because I literally had to put it together um, in the software. So I am going to go into Revit next, but I'm going to throw up my contact information because I'm not going to come back to the presentation. I'll also put this in the chat um, after during the Q&A session if you want it. Uh, so with, without further ado, let's go into Revit. All right, so this is what the Revit interface looks like. There's a lot of buttons. I know if you haven't seen it before, it can be overwhelming. I also teach the software as part of my, my job now. So um, here is that site model, right? So Harvey, I built- Harvey, we don't see your Revit. Oh, you don't see it? We only see your contact info. Ah, oh, I think I only shared, I must have only shared, okay. I must have only shared a uh, PowerPoint. Let me share. Oh, it's not going to let me share the whole screen. Okay, that's fine. We'll just share this one because I have two different sessions. Do you see it now? Yep, got it. Perfect. Okay, so this is the this is the site model. So I made a separate model that was the site model, and then I have a separate model that's just the what we believe were the existing uh, condition, the original. Uh, conditions of the quad. So here's the site model. So the beauty of this is that you can kind of zoom in, you can spin around, uh, you can look um, from all sorts of angles. Um, this is the model where I created a little walkthrough to walk through the building. Uh, so, you know, I have a 3D representation of the neighborhood in the computer and I can do whatever I want to do with it to understand the site. The one that's really the meat of it is this other one. And let me, I gotta switch it because I had two sessions of Revit open to make it easier. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is that Revit model, right? And so here I have, I can see all of the different um, panels and I can also uh, move around in it. I can take this box, which is actually a three-dimensional cropping box and I can crop it down into the building to see it, to get a better idea of what's inside and how I want to see it. I can crop it in multiple directions to go inside the building and to really understand. I made all of these things partially transparent to kind of make it a little bit easier to see what's going on. Um, so 
here I have uh, that actual corner that we uh, did the probe in. Uh, so if I go in here, I'm going to zoom up here. You can see these are those little angles that John was talking about uh, where the roof structure was offset and they had to kind of put these angles in to uh, support it. Now I built this to the original, uh, you know, what we thought was the original condition. So originally there was actually a soffit, right, that was precast. They took that off when they put on the um, the sloped roof. So there, but the original drawing so sh shows some sort of CMU here in that space in between. Um, one thing that was interesting is that we discovered, you know, there are these little like tie rods that were bolted on the outside. So when you go to the building now, well, when you went to it, it's demolished now, but before you would saw these little holes and they're actually marked as vent holes on the Habs drawings. But from analyzing all of these drawings and the, the patent, we realized that what they were was a strap to connect the soffit panel back to the roof structure. And so then they connected back to a rod. Um, and then the other cool thing that held this, I'm gonna hide this roof, is that there was actually a strap that connected on the top, right? Because we were looking at this and John was saying, well, structurally, how does this work? If you just tie it here, like the, the weight of it, right, is just off and it's not gonna stay. And then we're looking at him close and we're like, oh wait, look, there's a little note there that says U-strap. And we looked at it and we said, oh yeah. So they just added like a big staple <laughs> essentially to the top that was bolted on that held that on. So when the new roof, the, the roof, you know, the hip roof was put on, they just took those straps off. They took off the soffit and they put on the new, the new roof and they may have removed the CMU at the time. We're not 100% sure. Um, this is that same view, but with the color turned on so that you can see where all the different panels are. So the, the kind of pinky salmon color are the, um, the L-shaped panels, the green ones are the C-shaped panels, the pink are the floor panels. You can see the cyan are the window sills and then there's like a purpley color that's the window head. So as I kind of spin it around, you can get a good sense of where the different panel types are, right? The corner should be a different color. But. Um, now on top of that, you can actually create actual documentation outside of inside of Revit. So you make sheets, right? So here's a sheet. These, there's a floor plan. There's the first floor plan. There's the second floor plan. And I actually have these little details that I created. So I have these little details. They actually are on the sheet. Here are all the little details for the different conditions that make up the building. So you can do all of this stuff. You can analyze it um, however you need. Uh, and then there is a sheet that's that same slide that I showed um, before in my presentation. Um, so that is all I have, unless there's something else, Al or John, if you want me to go to a particular part of the model to show something, I'm happy to do that. Otherwise, I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Pervy and John and Al. That was just fantastic. <laughs> We're all kind of, a lot of the chat is like, wow, this is amazing. Uh, we do have one question from uh, earlier. This was actually during John's presentation. So it may be a question for John. Um, technical question about concrete. I thought I saw recent research that a major negative about use of concrete for structures that you wish to have a long life is that moisture can intrude, rust the rebar and cause major structural failure. In addition, there's a lot of recent talk about the value of structurally engineered timber frame construction, even for high rises. So anyone who has yeah. any thoughts on that? That's an, excellent, that, you know, that's an excellent question. All materials are susceptible to damage from water infiltration. Concrete is actually a little more durable but you do hit on a lot of the common issues. Steel reinforcement corrodes, um, but there is measures that engineers and architects employ to improve the durability of the concrete. Uh, I think it was ACI, which is American Concrete Institute, I think back in 20, 2011, uh, started implementing uh, uh, mixed design requirements for increased durability, like you need to have a certain compressive strength in your concrete. You need to limit the amount of water that you're integrating into your mix. 
You need to add some air content to allow that concrete to expand, all in the purpose of reducing cracking. Additionally, the ACI for a long time has specified minimum uh, requirements for position of reinforcement. You want that concrete to protect that, those steel bars. So for different types of structures and how they are exposed, the placement of those reinforcement bars are offset from the exterior face of the concrete. But yes, a lot of lessons learned had to go into the development of those code requirements. Um, but the concrete mix also cannot be overlooked. That needs to be investigated. Um, but you're right, you know, heavy timbers being used uh, or cross laminated timber or any of these new timber products are uh, being proposed for high rises, but they're going to deteriorate just as much, if not more, from water infiltration than concrete. But that's a good topic. Yeah. Goal number one. Uh, is get the water away from your building. That's 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 <laughs> preservation 101. And then another question is, do you think there are other buildings in the U.S. that use this same prefab system? That's really for any of you. I mean, I will take a stab at it, but I'll allow Al to comment. Um, I, quite honestly, I have not researched it more than the Ramsey homes. Uh, I have tried to find the Fab Creek uh, construction company. It seems like it's been purchased many times over and it's now out of someplace in, tech, in Texas, right. but I have not been able to um, find where this patent may have been employed elsewhere. Al, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, no, ma'am. We, I called around to the Precast Concrete Institute when we were going through this uh, Ramsey Homes process some time ago. Um, they were not aware of anything. There were rumors that this may have been used on some of the military bases like Murak Air Force Base in California or something. Um, but as John said, the Fab Creek was originally in Richmond. It was kind of a local thing. Um, I mean, no, we did not find it. And I think Thunderbird did some excellent, excellent research. So if Anna didn't turn it up, I don't know who would. And, and Pervy, does does Revit have a web app for you for if you want to make these interactive models accessible to the public? Can you navigate a walkthrough, or is it a pre-recorded tour? So there, so um, Revit, so Autodesk has an online platform called BIM 360 that a lot of firms are using right now to do their design work, especially with our work from home thing, because it puts all of your documents in the cloud so you can access them from anywhere. Uh, so BIM 360 does have a way to share a view with someone, but as of right now, I believe you have to have like an Autodesk login, which is free, but you have to have one in order to be able to access the Revit viewer. So there is a Revit viewer but again it's through the BIM 360 platform and and will the BIM drawings be made be added to the HABs records that's a good question I don't know yeah, we can, I thought it was a great we question can talk. <laughs> we can we can see if we if we want to do that I mean there are you know in own interpretation and there's definitely more that I can do to them I mean I definitely went down multiple rabbit holes trying oh, to yeah. build this thing and stayed up way too late too many nights just because it's fun and that's the kind of nerd I am but um, <laughs> I'm happy to share it with you know whoever, uh, whoever would want it. And I think, I mean, I can, I can put this, I actually built this model in BIM 360. So I can share a link to it, but you have to have an Autodesk account in order to get into it. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to look a little bit further though, into seeing if there's a way that we can make it more like put it up on the, the city's website in an interactive way that doesn't require any sort of login. Yeah, that would be great. And, and adding it to the Habs record, that would be great as well. Just more out there, just more information out there, all the more the better. Exactly. <laughs> I don't see, do we have any more questions? I don't see any more. John, you look like you want to. <laughs> yeah, so Susan, there was a great question by Danny. I don't know how far it is. Yes, do you want me to read it and you'll answer it? Sure, if you want to. <laughs> okay, as, as John said, uh, Danny Smith answered, asked a question a while back and then he answered it in the chat, but Let's go ahead and do this out loud. Danny asked, 
does the use of prefabricate, prefabricated structures render more complex the subsequent addition of systems such as electrical wiring and plumbing? Yeah, so uh, the answer is yes, uh, but the fab pre patent did have additional holes that were drilled between the flanges to allow for domestic water and conduit to be channeled through those, uh, the, through those holes. But even more so, I would say that prefabricated structures for renovations may cause additional stumbling than uh, traditional construction of you know, wood uh, or, mm -hmm. um, or other systems. But, uh, but that's definitely a, a good question. But luckily, I think in this case that Mr. Hines was thinking, you know, thinking ahead on some of those, um, uh, you know, the integration of structure and the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing systems. And, and was the rival Vitacrete system also patented? Uh, that's, a, that, that's a great question. So on the drawings that we have, it says that a patent is pending in 1942. Oh. <laughs> now, unfortunately, uh, the Fabcrete, we have Joseph Hines and in, in, in a lot of the kind of the, 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 the correspondence. So unfortunately with Vitacrete, I don't, you know, when I tried to research that patent, um, I really needed a name because you don't, um, you know, the, the patent's associated with the actual person. And just like Joseph Hines submitted for his patent, but didn't call it Fabcrete. So um, I do not know the status of that permit. I'm sorry, out of that, uh, uh, that um, patent. But it's a good topic for, you know, if someone wants to research it, I think that's yeah. a good... That's a good potential thesis or uh, preservation project. Anyone, anyone else have questions for our brilliant panelists? I, okay, I don't see any more questions coming in. I just a huge thanks to you three and a round of virtual applause. That was so great and so educational and wow, <laughs> fascinating too. Um, so uh, I, I would, at this point, I would like to introduce uh, Keith Pettigrew. Keith is the executive director of the Alexandria Redevelopment and Housing Authority, and he will give us an intro to a very fun video we're gonna see. Keith? Uh, thank you so much. Well, I wanna say just thank you to all of the panelists. Uh, what a wonderful day and a very informative day and an important day with regard to the Ramsey Homes uh, community as well as the property itself. Um, so on behalf of the AHA Board of Commissioners, our staff and residents of public housing in the city, uh, I just wanna say thank you for joining us today to take a closer look at the history of Ramsey's, Ramsey Homes community. As you've heard today, this is no ordinary community and its history must be preserved as we have done today. I'd like to say a special thanks to the city of Alexandria for hosting this important event and to all of the wonderful speakers who brought to life such compelling studies of archaeology, architecture, and most importantly, the people who call Ramsey their home. Uh, I want to send a special shout out to the City of Alexandria's Department of Housing. Uh, Helen McElvain, Eric Keeler, and their team have been an amazing partner in the development, the redevelopment of the Ramsey property. In addition, we work closely with the Thunder, Thunderbird Archaeology as they conducted an extensive study of the history of the site dating back to the Revolutionary War and the archaeological investigation and the artifacts discovered before we actually commence construction under this historic ground. Our team also worked with Char McCargo by the study of families who were the original inhabitants of Ramsey back in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, we found the study of the prefab construction of Ramsey fascinating as it shed light on the architectural methods used to build temporary housing uh, during World War II for the African-American workers. Uh, as the CEO of AHA, I am extremely proud that we preserve the affordability of this former public housing site which will now be known as Lineage at North Patrick Street. Uh, the new name for this beautiful 52 unit building pays homage to the long history shared today. Uh, from our heart's perspective, we think it's vital uh, for future generations to learn from the policies of previous generations the segregated people of lower incomes and different races. Ramsey, now Lineage, commences a new policy at AHA where we will diligently seek to integrate our properties economically and increase the number of affordable units we have across our properties. 
the number of affordable units at lineage increased more than threefold from 15 to 52. This is a trend we look to continue as we redevelop and preserve our affordable housing stock in the city. I wanted to say thank you for this invaluable and timely presentation, given our current socio-political climate. Uh, they all underscore the importance of fighting for policies that lead us closer to the perfect union that we must all stand for in this nation. And with that, uh, we will now share a 60 minute clip of Ramsey slash lineage. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gretchen Bulova, and I'm the director of the Office of Historic Alexandria. You've met most of the planning team members throughout the day, but I just want to take a moment to thank them for their incredible work on this virtual symposium. Eric Keeler, Audrey Davis, Eleanor Breen, Susan Hellman, Bill Conkey, Catherine Miliaris, Al Cox, John Dumsick, Linda Lovell, and Sarah Scott. Thank you. And a special thank you to Michelle Longo with Historic Alexandria, who adeptly coordinated the Zoom webinar and ensured a smooth technology day. Thank you, Michelle. Many thanks to our presenters for sharing their research and experience on the history, genealogy, architecture, and archaeology of the Ramsey homes. I too hope that we will see a few publications from this project and research. So thank you to Kristen Moon, Anna Mass, Tara Ba, Al Dumsick, John, um, Al Cox, uh, John Dumsick, Herbie Irwin. Thank you so much. We especially appreciate the remarks this morning from our mayor, Justin Wilson, and director of housing, Helen McElvain, and just now from the executive director of ARHA, Keith Pettigrew. So please, everyone, um, give, give our team a virtual applause. Thank you. And finally, thank you for your attendance today and, and especially your thoughtful questions. We will be posting the recorded sessions on alexandriava.gov slash historic by February 26th. It's really the same link that you registered for the symposium today. To learn more about the history of Alexandria and upcoming programs for Black History Month and even Historic Preservation Month that's coming in May, Please follow Historic Alexandria on social media and sign up for our e-newsletter on, on our website. Be well and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.